Um, it basically tells you all kinds of landforms that are used when when researchers look at glacial landscapes and try to understand the history of the, of the land of the landscape and the history of the ice sheets. Um, and it goes from you know uh, forms that form within a very short time period from days or weeks or perhaps month, such as inscriptions on bedrock by the, the scratches that the ice sheet leaves behind it, as well as uh, reorientation of particles in subglacial deposits, such as tills, to, you know, landforms that take more and more time to form. There's this middle ground where, you know, there's, there's landforms that form during one or perhaps two or, you know, glaciations. And then you have a top, prior, a top group here um, where all the landforms take normally more than one glaciation to form. So, as it says here, that landforms that build glacial landscapes and that are formed during one glacial stage or less, and they are therefore very suitable for reconstructing ice sheet evolution during a full glacial cycle. And for this particular lecture and the length that we have, this is the the this is the uh, the the, um, the one that we're gonna. This is the focus of the of of the lecture. Um, Well, in order to understand glacial landforms, you really need to know, know a little bit about glaciers and ice sheets. So uh, just a few, few words on that. Here you see a picture from in the background from uh, the um, Tibetan Plateau, uh, where we've uh, in, in our research group uh, studied extensively, you know, the, the glacial history of glaciers in, in, that, in that region. Um, so we can ask us what you know what are the, per the pertinent things we need to think about in order to understand how glacial landforms form and these are the kind of the the uh, the topics that you need to think about first of all is the temperature distribution within an ice uh, as you all know ice is cold but ice can be really cold or can be you know almost or entirely melting um, and when we talk about ice that is melting and and if it's underneath a glacier we talk about ice that is at the pressure melting point then ice is relatively soft and it can uh, it has good uh, good uh, physical um, parameters to change the landscape coupled to the temperature of the ice is the ice flow mechanism and i'll show you that you know ice flows in, in different ways it, it, it deforms and it glides and and, and so forth so we'll look at that um, and with that, you know, the way the ice can flow is also determines how fast it can flow. So these are really important parameters in order to understand how much a, glacial, a landscape can be changed and therefore look like a glacial landscape. And then in addition to that, we need the material that the ice sheet transports at the base. And then I'm not thinking about the ice, but loose particles, as you see lots of it here in the foreground, you know, ice might pick up material and help, and that material may help reshape the landscape. And then it's the water availability at the base of an ice sheet that, that helps with you know, the reshaping of the landscape. And this ultimately ties very closely to the temperature distribution and that in turn determines again the flow mechanism. And in the end, it's of course time. If we have had, if we have hundreds of thousands of years underneath an ice sheet, then you have a lot of time to change the landscape. It's only a short period of 10,000 years, then there's little time or less time to do, to do so. Another shot from a glacial uh, area. This is from the, the dry valleys in Antarctica. So these glaciers are really uh, very stiff, very cold. It's very cold temperatures. But also in front of this glacier, you see a pile of dirt being you know, pushed up and, and deposited. So here we can ask about the cells, you know, how, how is it that you know, these cold, cold glaciers behave? Do they, do they, how, do, how do they flow? And then it turns out if you study the flow of glaciers, then there are basically three ways in which the ice is being propelled forward. Um, one that we call internal deformation. In the next slide, you see that for that they use the uh, term UF. So U is in velocity and then F. Um, and internal deformation means that the ice at the base is, is steady, so it doesn't move at all. So all movement is, is part of the ice, thick, through the ice thickness. So it's a deformation thing. But you can also have differential movement between the, the sole of the ice and, its, and the underlying uh, landscape, and then you call it basal sliding, given as US. And then, of course, you can have the sediments underneath could deform, and that would also give you a 
a, a, a component of, of ice flow motion. So if you put that into a, 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 a schematic uh, representation, and this one is a famous one from uh, uh, Boulton from 1996, um, then you can see those three different representations when ice is stuck to this, it's basically frozen to its substrate and all movement, so this is through the ice pack, all movement is through deformation. And because if the lower is if there's different deformation in the lower pack of the ice, then all the ice above will, you know, ride upon its back. So you have the highest flow at the surface. Now you could get an additional, this is just by ice thickness. So the thicker the ice, the more the, de the deformation. So if you have a similarly thick ice, but it also is wet bed, and so there is water at the base and it can slide, then you're getting an extra component here given as the US is the sliding component. The deformation will still happen. So you have an extra speed component. And it may happen that you even get the, the deformation of the underlying deposit. If this is not frozen anymore, but wet and very water saturated, then it might actually deform very quickly. And you get, a, 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 again, another component. So as we measure ice surface and velocity at, at the surface of an ice of an ice sheet, we don't know necessarily if it's just the deformation or if indeed there is even a lot of deformation of the, of the subglacial substrate. So you can look at this in a, as you know three kind of end member varieties of an ice sheet. One is where the ice sheet is basically wet based everywhere, which is given in this red color. And so all, along all the length of the, the ice sheet, you have both the, the component of basal sliding and you have a deformation profile. And as the ice is sliding across the landscape, a lot of landforms are being formed. And the, the, we're going to go through some of these of, you know, what, which ones are important for us to understand. But you'll, you'll remember as we go through that we look at lineation systems, we look at eskers, which are sediments deposited in subglacial tunnels. And here you see some of those re represented. And maybe there's a pile of dirt at the end of the, the, the ice sheet, and it's, uh, we call it an end moraine. Now, you could have something that is uh, completely frozen. So that basically everywhere, uh, or no, this is uh, halfway, of course, this is a frozen core and it's sliding at the, towards the end. So it's warm based at the margins, but it's frozen in the interior. And so you have an interior part where basically not much happens. There's no landform formation in the interior part, but when the ice starts becoming warm, you're getting the similar kind of imprints as you see here. Now, the, the other end member is when everything is frozen. When everything is frozen, then there is no basal sliding, all is through deformation. There's basically no landform formation, but as ice melts, the water runs off, and that water runoff then also forms landforms. And we're going to look at those as well. Okay, so glaciers, they can do a lot of work. And they do that when the, the wet, when the conditions are such that there's water at the base of the ice. So it's, it's wet bed, so it's basal melting. And of course, when the ice flows, it does that. And it, when it has, you know, some sort of a thickness of, let's say, more than 50 meters or something like that. So basically, all, everywhere where we look at ice sheet imprints, the ice did flow because it was thick. And if the, if the ice, the basal conditions were wet bed, then we do get imprints. And the glacial erosion basically happens through three different processes. Two that have been long recognized as abrasion and plucking, and one that has been just very recently described as ripping. And I'm just going through those very quickly. The abrasion process you basically see here is when in the sole of the ice, so here we're underneath an ice, underneath a glacier. So we're in a tunnel in the, in the glacier, and we see how a piece of rock dragged by the glacier. The glacier is flowing here from right to left across this image. Uh, as, the, as the glacier is, is flowing along and it's pressing very hard on this rock, and this rock is then in turn very hard pressing on this bedrock underneath, then you, perhaps you already see that there is all kinds of scratches on this bedrock. And that's what glacial abrasion is. It's basically particle by particle erosion of the underlying landscape by the friction of you know, the ice and it's dirt in the ice and, and, the, and the underlying bedrock in this case. You know, and that may, may look, if you're in the field, it may look something like this. You know, you have all these, uh, uh, all these imprints, these, the, the, the thicker ones that we call grooves and the smaller ones that we call uh, striations uh, or striae. And they tell us something. They tell us something that ice was flowing along this axis. So it, says, it tells you the ice flow direction. And because there, are diff there may be different directions on this, such as you see on this piece of bedrock here, and you see the different directions, you can tell that ice flow has varied over time and you can see what is younger and what is older. So for this, we need these tools that we saw in the former picture. We need the overburden, the ice thickness, and that gives us the pressure, right? And that's, so we'll get the ice flow. Another 
way that ice modifies its landscape is through plucking. And plucking means that basically the ice pries loose big pieces of bedrock and transports them as pieces of bedrock away from its original location. Maybe these pieces came you know, just from here and were dragged just a short distance away. Uh, and, and this is a very typical landscape in, in where you can see that, where you have like a, an, an asymmetric landforms like this, where they, you know, there's basically one side and then there, there's a steeper side and from the steeper side pieces have been pried off and that's the plucking. And for the plucking, basically what you have is that uh, the, this, this ice is very wet based, so there's meltwater and the meltwater is basically being produced as ice here comes in from the left and is flowing to the right. It basically has a stoss site, which you see here, where there's extra pressure and so extra much water is be being produced. It then flows around these unevenness, like, like you see here, and when it comes to the backside, basically the pressure is being reduced and some of that water will refreeze. And as it, when it refreezes into cracks in the bedrock, then, and that, and that water refreezes and it expands as it becomes ice, it expands with 9%, then basically you're prying loose pieces of rock, you know, along, along weakness planes within the bedrock. And then, and this is called plucking. And this gives a very uh, effective way of removing a lot of material in a short time. And basically this plucking that can happen in bedrock, but also in sediments, especially when the sediment is frozen or yeah, when the sediment is frozen, which is not an uncommon feature underneath ice sheets that, that sediment may be frozen. And what one landform that you get from this is was what we call Roche Moutonnais. When you have this, just off this picture on the left, there's the Stoss site. Here you see the top of the Roche Moutonnais, and then you get the back side, which is a really steep site. And in a you know in a in a, in a schematic form, is it looks like this, basically an unevenness in underneath the ice. The ice is flowing from left to right. So and when it when it, it hits this like uh, this hump here, it it goes slightly around or across, and this is all on the Stoss side. So ice is high pressure here, a lot of water produced. It comes to the backside, it refreezes, and you're getting plucking on this side, and you're getting a steep backside. And these, you know, very asymmetric landforms are very typical for glacial landscapes, and they tell us again something about the ice flow direction, also about the fact that the ice was wet based and it actually refreeze in the back. So that was very close to being frozen and wet based. The third process that I want to talk about and that is re recently recognized is ripping. And this is when the subglacial water uh, not just goes around and refreezes on the back and, and, and plucks material, it actually goes through into the, the high pressure of the water. It goes into, into fractures that already exist or perhaps are being formed by the high pressure of the water in the bedrock. Um, and basically has the, has the potential to just lift up all you know, large slabs of rock and at, en masse transports them away. Um, and you know this is kind of a, a representation how you might you know how you might have a kind of a a, 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 um, a Roche Moutonnet kind of form that disintegrates that way, or that you might have just a, a rather flat landscape topography that has these uh, these uh, joints in them that then become exploited by ice transport. And the reason to have inferred that this happens is that, you know, when you look in excavations here and there in Sweden, and you can find these, these joints that are really filled with, you know, what we infer to be subglacial sediments. Um, they have been pumped in there by subglacially by the water flow and, and later, you know, and basically lifted up this whole, this whole uh, masses of rock, you know, by 70 or 80 centimeters in, in, in particular cases such as in here. Um, this is, is a very special case where they dug a, a big canal, which is now water filled, you know, to connect the power plant to the sea. So it's, it's now part of the, 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 the sea. But when they did that and it was all dredged and you could see these, 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 these fantastic structures and, this, and the silt filling in of them. So really these are the three main processes by which ice is impacting bedrock and really, you know, lowers the landscape and in, in some places really cuts down significantly into the landscape. Okay, what are the kind of landforms that we see in the field that we then, you know, try to understand, you know, what has the ice done in the past? Um, and we start with uh, some, these are the landforms that we're gonna look at, you know, it's just a, a small cross section of, of the landforms that but these are the most important perhaps for understanding, you know, the, the spatial, evolution of, uh, of, uh, of ice sheets uh, from landforms. 
And one of them is that, uh, that in some of these slides we called lineations, or more specifically, one might call them drumlins. There are other terms for this as well, crag and tails and, and flutes and et so forth. So these are formed. These are long linear features um, formed in the direction of ice flow. So they elongated to ice flow. And so when we find these, we recognize these features, then we can tell that ice flow you know, was from the upstream side of that landform to the downstream flight. So, so we follow the, the axis of ice flow at the time when these landforms were formed. Well, drumlins are uh, a, a feature that has been um, recognized a long time ago. It's one of the oldest features we understand. And here you see like uh, Glückert in, uh, from a Finnish survey uh, looked at a lot of these landforms. These, these are, you know, plan imagery from the shapes of landform of these drumlins. So you, you see these are contours. So you see that they have an upper side. In this, in this picture, all the ice comes from the top. Here you see the arrow from the top to the bottom. So you see that the upstream side or the stoss side usually is steeper. You see more contours here. Uh, and then they have a tail towards the downstream side. So they are very asymmetric landforms, just as the Roche Moutonnais, except that these are in sediment. So they have that similar asymmetric shape with a steeper stoss side and a, and a gentler and long elongated tail side, except that there is no plucking in these. So it has these, it has just continuous tails. And you see they come in all, you know, all kinds of sizes from super elongated to, you know, more almost equidimensional, but it is really these asymmetric and strongly elongated landforms that tell us very particular, very clearly, you know, that there was strong ice flow well, that means a lot of meters per year. Um, and it's, it, it tells us the ice flow direction. It tells us there's uh, subglacial melting going on. So it tells, it tells us a lot of the properties of the ice at that particular time when these were formed. You see that in this, it's a little bit small, of course, but you see maybe there are dots in here. Um, and, and these dots are known or visible outcrops of bedrock. So it's very common that there, you know, there used to be a hump, let's say, of bedrock in here you know, almost like the Roche Moutonnet that was sitting there. And then the ice has kind of on top of it and in the lee plastered a lot of sediments and made this like a, and, and when, the, when there is bedrock in here, then we, then we typically call them crag, which is the bedrock and tails. Uh, and when they're more just sedimentary features, then we, then we normally call them drumlins. Well, they have particular size and, you know, spatial dish, uh, dimensions. Uh, this is an, 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 uh, an inventorization of more than 3,000 drumlins in northern Sweden. And you can see here, you know, they have, they're, they're typically a couple of hundred meters long. Um, but you have them in this particular survey up to seven and a half kilometers long. Um, and they have a, a height of, you know, uh, hundreds uh, or tens to hundreds of meters uh, in, 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 in particular cases. Well, how do they look like? Well, you know, they're gentle land, landforms. Here we're standing on one. So, you know, where it says Northern Sweden here is basically we're standing on the ridge of one of these, uh, one of these uh, drumlins. And here in the foreground, you see this, here you see the, the stoss site and then you're getting the tail of the lee site. Here you see a stoss site, you get a tail of the lee site. So here are two drumlins. So there are three neighboring drumlins. And that's quite typical because here, this is the same, the same, uh, the same place. So this is the drumlin that I am standing on, on the tail here, and I'm looking at these drumlins in the back. So you see that, you know, there are a number of drumlins in this area of photograph. You know, this is a space of 10 kilometers, only space of, you know, 10, 15 kilometers. We have like five or so drumlins. And indeed, if you go and you zoom out and you look at the aerial photographs from, you know, higher elevation, and this is the one from Canada, and you see very clearly these elongated landforms in the landscape. These are all drumlins uh, with clearly stoss side and really uh, clearly tails. Uh, and so because of their asymmetric shape, we can absolutely tell that ice was coming from the upper left and flowing towards the lower right. And here's from a, a shot from a helicopter. Um, picture and then you see again these uh, photographs or these these uh, tails in the in the in, in, in the in you know the stoss and the morphology in here mind you this is not from scotland this is from british columbia not sure why i would write scotland there but that went wrong um well drumlins like i said they are the, you know perhaps the most important feature so i spent some time on that 
you can just see them as these you know kind of cigar shaped elongated you know they say something about an, a certain ice flow right but they're not always this nice sometimes you know they look more like this and why you know they, this is not a, a great example for drumlin you might say but you actually you might learn something of this i mean if you have these and you go you know you look across the landscape and they start to change you know we, we see that we still have the drumlins but there's other features on top of it you know other drumlins smaller ones that are sitting on top of it in a different direction and then you might see these other ones getting more clear and you can still see kind of the ghost in the back of the original drumlin that was in this and then in the end of course you might get to a, a, a place where you only see drumlins in another direction so you might actually learn about time you know how in time or in space so this is in time whereas this perhaps is in space you know from the ice margin to the ice divide you know you might start off with a landscape that has these and in the ice divide if they might be preserved and when you get closer and closer to the ice margin and more and more ice flow you might actually then the other you might actually reshape them and just find the other one. So th this might be time and space, you know, modification of original landforms. And so we, we, we know, we sometimes we find these really nice ones, as you saw in the photographs, or sometimes we see these kind of, you know, kind of iffy ones. And sometimes we see, you know, and this may just be a spatial or, or a temporal pattern. Much smaller landforms, but similarly are flutes. And here's a nice example from uh, where we have. So that you see here, Tarfla. This glacier is called Itzfalz Glacier and the Icefall Glacier. This is a you know, rather steep section. It's now retreating, so it's get, getting less and less steep and less and less icefall, but this is the Icefall Glacier. But in its forefield, you see all these lines, all these, you know, these elongated strips of uh, subglacial sediment, tills. And you call this forefield as a fluted forefield. And it's, you know, it's a form of lineation system that uh, that is tells us the, the ice flow direction now in, in a case of of course you may have the glacier in front of you it's kind of obvious the glacier came from there and comes towards us right but but if you see it in a paleo setting you know far away from glaciers and formed by ice sheets then they they similarly inform you of of um, of of the ice flow direction so you could then gather all that information and here you see an example of uh, publication by uh, clearman and others from 1997 where they kind of Make it made an inventorization of all these lineations throughout the Fennoscandian Peninsula, um, and so you you know now this is this looks like you know from this distance very diff difficult, but they're all small basically lineation marks, and they tell you about the, the complexity in the landscape, and we'll we'll get to that in a in a in a in a short while. Okay, the next landform type, and which is you see here, are the end moraines. And end moraines have all kinds of forms. Here you have two particular examples from the Kola Peninsula. So here's a ridge that that you know wraps around like this and you know impounds a lake. And here is a similar ridge, but a much broader one uh, with the, that has several ridges. And again, it impounds a lake. So end moraines are ridges in the landscape, and they basically tell us that the margin of the glacier was right around here. And as it did, it deposited this these ridges. And you can really see this as like a kind of a bandwagon of uh, material being deposited at, at the glacier front, basically part particles being dumped or through shear going, uh, being deposited at the, at, at the edge. Um, and so, you know, if you go to current glaciers, again here if, from the Tarfala research station, we see this glacier, this was Eastfalls Glacier, now we have Stu Glacier in here, and you see this is, you know, you see the very clearly the ed, you know, how big this glacier has been sometime in the past, and as it built this ridge at the very edge of that glacier, and, and in this case, during the Little Ice Age. That's the, that's the Tarfla research station. And again, you can also make a, you know, a map of all the end moraines that we have in the, in the region of, uh, of, of uh, Scandinavia. And then you see that you know, actually most of the end moraines are beyond Scandinavia. They are in Northern Poland and Germany and you know, the Baltic States and in Russia. Um, as the ice was as as, at its largest, you know, ended up uh, along the shores and beyond uh, in these uh, countries. And as it retreated, it has deposited, you know, several ridges uh, as it was standing still for at times. It, it did deposit quite a few ridges in southern Sweden, and you know, the last ridge is, you know, just south of, of uh, Stockholm, uh, and is a very prominent ridge that was formed during the last cold period before 
the uh, Holocene, which is called the Young Dryas. You'll hear a little bit more about that later. Well, that those are the subglacial uh, and um, uh, and marginal morainic landforms. Then we have a whole another group of landforms, which is by formed by glacial hydrology. So the water that is running off the ice and, and that forms landforms. And basically, you know, you have these two kind of, you know, you could have a cold glacier, right? And then nothing of that water finds its way through the ice and it runs off at the edge. Or you could have a warm glacier where basically the ice, the water that is produced at the surface by melt can penetrate through cracks and moorlands towards the base and then helps with the ice flow and with the formation of landforms at the base. And, you know, there's lots of landforms, you know, you have depositional landforms, you have erosional landforms, they can be in the subglacial, so underneath the ice, they can be marginal at the edge of the glacier, or the ice sheet, and they can be beyond the ice, but, you know, you would need the ice in order to get these landforms. So all these are, you know, forms that you could study. I'll just highlight three of them. One subglacial, which is the eskers um, that are produced in subglacial tunnels. Then lateral channels, which is an erosional landform, where water uh, flows along the edge of a, of a glacier and ice sheet. And then we have one that tells us something about there being a, an ice margin that impounds lakes uh, and we, of the lakes, perhaps we see the shorelines. So this is a picture of an esker in northern Sweden. So you see this winding ridge, um, you know, along the bottom and they typically are formed, you know, the lowest part of the landscape. So you often see them in um, in lakes like in here so you know because it's the bottom of the of the of the, of the, of the landscape and that you know the the the, the esker just keep keeps on continuing for a long time and the way the way we have uh, learned that these form is that they form in tunnels that are subglacially just at the margin of the ice so basically as the water is directed towards the margin along the bottom of the uh, ice sheet it forms in these tunnels that are formed by you know the erosion of that water subglacially into the into the ice uh, soul, but as the flow diminishes towards the end of the summer, it basically fills these whole these these tunnels up with the sediment that it is tra transporting. And as the ice is retreating year by year, it then leaves that ridge behind. And in the next season, you're getting a new tra transport system, and it you know transports a lot of water. And that at the end of that summer, it again fills up with sediments. And so basically, these are annual accumulations of sediments as the ice retreats, you know, from its maximum to where it, wherever it disappears. So they tell us something that, you know, that the ice margin was perpendicular to these eskers. So you can then trace the eskers and, and get a really nice record of the ice margin locations. So again, this is a, a map of, uh, you already seen the map of the end moraines. Now on that, we have overlain the, 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 the traces of the eskers. So you see eskers are numerous. And basically wherever we see the integration of the eskers and the end moraines, then they are perpendicular to each other, like you would expect. You know, we know that they form perpendicular to the ice margin and along the ice margin, you get a ridge, then these need to be perpendicular to each other. And, and you, you know, by and large, we see that everywhere is, is the case. So those are very good indications of uh, the glacier fluvial state. And then you have as ice is, um, you know, it has, it has a topography with high parts and low parts, then the water that's being produced on the ice surface will run off towards the sides. And if, you know, when it runs off to the sides and it, in, you know, it, it encounters a slope, then the ice, then the water will run on the ice surface or besides the ice surface on the ice slope. So on the junction between the ice and, this, and, this, and the slope. And, you know, if you look, if you look at the paleo record and here you have, you know, the mountain ridge, it, it slopes into the valley and you see that on that, on that slope, you have these fluvial valleys. And we all know how fluvial valley works. You know, it goes basically the straight line, you know, from the top to the bottom, right? Just to, uh, from the high point to the low point in the strong, in the, in the sh shortest distance, the steepest gradient. Now, these don't do that, as you see. They don't go from here to here. They go from the bottom to, you know, to the, to the top of the image. So they go parallel to the slope. And they can only do that if they are forced to do so by an ice margin, yes? So we had an ice tongue lying in this, in this valley. And then along the margin of that ice, Water was flowing sometimes on the ice, sometimes on this, on this, on the, on the slope. And as it flow, was flowing on the slope, it would cut a valley, and then it would cut the valley on the ice, and then on the slope, and then on the ice, and on the slope, and it was on the ice for a while, and the slope again. So you have these kind of bends in here that you know, as the ice as it was bending on towards the, the slope, it cut out a, a fluvial valley section. 
And then of course you can see that in time, this glacier, this, this glacier is you know, decreasing in, in volume and you know, making these lateral uh, channels at lower elevations. So really the direction and the slope of these channels tell us exactly where the ice margin was and in which direction the ice margin was, uh, was uh, sloping. So really helpful for reconstruction of uh, the, for, the form of the margin of, the, of, of, of an ice sheet. And the final landform that I want to talk about, uh, you know, as landforms that we use is are the glacial lake shorelines and, and channels. Um, you know, you could think of it as something like this, that as, as the ice is thinning and there's an uneven topography and you so sometimes you have then some tops st sticking through, we would call them noon attacks. Um, you might around these noon attacks and depending on the slope of the glacier, you might start to get, you know, that the ice sheet is, is pulling away its margin and the water is running down, but the, the water is impeded by, you know, these obstructions. And so a lake is formed, you know, between this high ground and the ice that is retreating and it will, you know, it will fill up to a certain level where it will find the lowest pass point and then cut a channel and basically spill over to a lower level, right? And so we might see the evidence of there having been a lake here because there may be shorelines of that lake and we might see the channels where they have the overflow. And here you have an example from Jämtland uh, um, in Sweden, it's, it's called Drommenskoran where you can see, you know, here we are on the upstream, you, this is a photograph on the upstream side of this obstacle, where you see the shorelines here, these, 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 these light, light lines, and they continue here. And then you see this gap that is, you know, it's exactly the lowest point in this ridge, a big gap was cut. And you can see it here from below, you know, you see the big gap. And so they, it tells us that at some point, a lot of water has flown there. And we see on the other side, the, the traces of, a, of, of a shorelines. So we can now see that, okay, there must have been a lake there and that lake, how could there be a lake unless there was an ice margin that would block the water from draining into a different direction. And so you can then construct an ice margin that would have to be there in order to get that lake. So these are the glacial lakes and they are really useful features. And here's a very famous example of uh, glacial lakes in uh, Scotland. So they're called the parallel roads of Glen Roy. Um, and you know, they have been, you, you see they're really, really, prominent lines in the landscape. And we have similar nice ones actually in uh, Sweden. Um, so, and with these, you can see that actually uh, that was a very fairly common feature. And you can see that in this map where we've mapped uh, the occurrences of glacial lakes, uh, you know, during deglaciation in on the Scandinavian peninsula. And you see that, you know, it varies from, you know, huge glacial lakes that would, you know, this lake needed to have an ice margin that blocked you know, it finally drained here at what's called Mount Billingen. So the ice margin was here blocking this lowest point. Um, and, you know, the overflow at that point was here through the, through the, around through the Denmark Strait here. Uh, so this was a high point and, you know, it filled until it was basically was flowing over here. And then as, as ice started to retreat from this point, then the lake, you know, drained massively through here into the, in, into the North Atlantic. But also in the mountains, you know, you see when ice retreats and, you know, higher topography is ice free, but lower topography still um, is blocked by the ice. For example, you could just imagine at some point that, you know, the ice may have looked something like this, you know, with a high point here, but with a tongue in here, and that tongue would have blocked these different valleys. And so these would have been having glacial lakes as well as valleys that were draining in this direction. So you could, you know, with help, if you know when these lakes were active, you could then help, you know, saying that, okay, if this lake was 10,200 years active, then, you know, that at 10,200 years, you needed to have a, 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 a blockage of, 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 of ice blocking this valley. So we can use these landforms to tell us something about, you know, the retreat in this case. So all these, all these um, landforms taken together, uh, they start to paint a picture from the geomorphology of, you know, how ice, you know, give from its maximum when we have, you know, the end moraines, um, when we have the lineation systems that tell us, you know, how ice was flowing, where we have eskers that tell us, you know, how the ice margin was basically retreating. And as it did, it, it, it built these eskers is as long ridges uh, of, of glacial fluvial sediment as it blocked these lakes, uh, as it, as it uh, formed these lateral channels, we're really getting a, 
rather good spatial image of how the ice sheet has behaved. And, you know, the best image that we get is basically from it being at a maximum and retreating to, you know, to the final place where it deglaciated. And so this is the basically the deglaciation phase of the ice sheet. And, you know, you could do that, uh, show that cartoonish by, you know, this, this would be cycling back from about 25,000 years ago to about uh, deglaciation at about 8,000 years ago. You see how the ice sheet uh, changes its form. And this is purely based on geomorphology. So I'll see if I can run it once more. I could perhaps not do that. I could do this and that. You see it again, so we go from 22. So you see when it's retreating here, it's still advancing here on this side. And then it starts to retreat here as well. So you can see this asynchronous behavior, but to get that asynchronous behavior, to know what the IC did in different sectors, we need to do more, of course. We need to also have dating in, into the picture and some of that will come up in the, in the continuation of uh, this uh, lecture. Um, okay. Well, we've talked a little bit about, you know, what are the landforms that we uh, use to tell us about uh, the deglaciation of, uh, or yeah, the reconstruction of ice sheets. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about, you know, what is the material by which we do that. Um, and the first part is really, you know, is to get an imprint of these, you know, how do we know which landforms are where and you know what, what steps do we take in order to um, make sense of the, you know, we, of course you can understand that the landscape is enormously complex. So, you know, you need to, you need to try to make some sense of it. Okay. Well, the first part of course is about mapping landforms. Uh, and for that, we've traditionally used aer aerial photographs, air photos. Um, up to about the 80s, perhaps uh, the air photos were the medium to do, uh, and much of what you've seen, you know, of the inventorization that you've seen has been done by aerial photographs. Um, so thousands and tens of thousands of aerial photographs tell us, you know, that landform history uh, or the land landform the dis distributions for these uh, glacial areas. But since the late 70s, and you know, and all through, and certainly today. We do we use satellite imagery, and you know, of course, they have become better and better. Starting basically with the Landsat uh, era, um, we now have you know a multitude of different satellite uh, imagery packages that one could use to do uh, mapping. In much more, um, you know, and Google Earth today, of course, is is one of those uh, platforms in which you could, you know, see satellite imagery of very good quality and and helps you visualize the landscape, or you can see the the landscape uh, using satellite imagery. The latest, uh, of course, is now lidar, uh, where you know laser laser um, measurements of the Earth's surface give us an, an unprecedented uh, detail. Uh, of, um, of, of, the, of the landscape, um, especially as uh, it's possible to subtract uh, the vegetation from, from the LiDAR imagery, you really get a very good imagery of, uh, of, the, of the current land surface. Um, so yeah, aerial photographs. Here is a remote sensing satellite image uh, of, a, of a drumlin field. So again, you see these, these lines go through here everywhere. You see that? Very, rather clearly. So this is a drumlin field in uh, Canada. Um, here you see uh, a uh, LIDAR imagery from uh, southwestern Finland, where you see basically moraines here. They're called the air moraines. It's not a, a category we talk about today, but it's, it's, it's basically formed as the ice was deglaciating in, in water, which in the Baltic would have been, you know, uh, the, the Baltic Sea. Uh, and as, as it did that, it, it formed a particular type of uh, moraines that showed where the ice margin was, or close to the ice margin was. Um, and these are called the air moraines. But you see very clearly, these, these are not massive features, um, but they come out very, very clearly <coughs> using LiDAR imagery. So uh, beyond then that, uh, we have uh, the... Um, we, have, we use photo photography. So sometimes, you know, like I said, we use uh, aerial photography, but sometimes you can have uh, 
um, other types of photography. So this is not vertical, but uh, oblique photography. It's a very nice shot of, again, a drumlin field where the ice basically came from the far field here towards us and then makes almost a 90 degree turn and disappears in this direction. Um, and, you know, the, the, the array of drumlins tells us really well that change in, in, in ice flow direction. Um, so that kind of imagery is, uh, is, is used. Of course, we can make uh, observations in the field uh, through field work. So here are observations of striation patterns on bedrock surfaces and where you can see that sometimes you can see two or three or four. In this case, you can see three different ice flow directions in, in purple, in yellow, so here's again the purple, and here's again the yellow, and in white, which is here on the side. So you basically have three different directions that are being recorded. Um, and you know, then you can try to compare these faces and see you know, if, if, if the ice flow was in this direction, then this would have been in the backside, right? It would have been the lee. So this would have been protected. Uh, so this would be older than that one. And you can compare these different ice flow directions and deduce which one is younger and which one is older and learn a bit about that. And of course, you know, when we, as we started, we go back to your earlier mapping um, and, you know, and use, make use of existing maps. Um, and this is, you know, the, we, we come back, to, I take this one, it's a, a mapping by uh, Klaus Hetterstrand, uh, and we'll come back to this one as an, as an example of how you go from, you know, the multitude of landforms that you can find to, you know, a map representation of these landforms. Um, okay. I think this would be a reasonable time to uh, take a little break, I think. Um, and then I continue uh, in about uh, 13 minutes. So at 12 sharp, um, we could, uh, I will continue this lecture. Um, and so stretch your legs, get the, some blood flowing, and then uh, I'll see you back in, uh, in, ten, in a little bit more than 10 minutes. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, continue the lecture on the reconstruction of ice sheets. And we're getting into the part where we really do the paleoglaciological technique, inversion technique to get to understanding what ice sheets did and how they looked like. Um, so let's see, did I get this to work again? There. <clears throat> Just to remind you now after the a little break, the landforms that we're gonna look at um, in this inversion of landforms to glacial properties are lineation systems here represented in these uh, more newly LIDAR imagery. Um, so here you see clearly these elongated landforms, the drumlins and the crag and tails. Um, as well as you see some meltwater cuts through these long tails. You see here, you see a long drumlin and it has several meltwater cuts right through it. Oh, that's not a normal direction for a, for a river to, to take across a height. So it would have needed a nice margin to do that. So here you see you know, several landforms here in one. It's so another type of moraine we haven't talked about. Uh, we talked about end moraines. I showed you the, the air moraine um, earlier. And this is a rip moraine. Uh, we haven't talked about that either in much detail, but it's interesting because it's formed, we think. It's still something that's quite a bit of research about, but we think it's formed at the border where ice was frozen to its substrate to where it was melting at its substrate. And so you go from a place where there's only internal deformation to a place where they're sliding. And you could just see how much tension there will be between, you know, frozen upstream sliding downstream. <coughs> and this phase change from, you know, frozen to, to, uh, to sliding is, is not a, a, you know, it's not a vertical wall or horizontal, it, it's usually sloping. So we think that phase change happened in the sediments first. So at some depth into the sediment, let's say two meters depth, it would have become, you know, pressure melting, whereas the, 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 the sediment above would still be frozen to the, to the ice. And as the ice then starts deforming that layer where it starts melting, you're basically breaking up the sediments. And these are basically broken up ribs. So if you, know, you could put 
can basically push this all together as if you have an accordion, you know, you're making music, you basically can push them all together again and, and just reduce that landscape that is now drawn out back into as if it was a puzzle. So these are rip moraine. Um, then, we, of course, we have our esker systems. Again, a nice slide from a uh, LIDAR where you see the esker again in the lowest part of the landscape. Uh, you see lineation systems here on the side, on either side of this, clearly. <clears throat> but this esker system really shows you the ice flow was at that point along this direction, whereas the lineation system tells you a different direction. So these are different in time. And then, of course, you get end moraine systems. And this is an uh, imagery where, you know, such as on the Kola Peninsula here, where you have these, these marginal deposits. Okay, so we have these inf the information. You've already, already seen the, map the maps of them. Um, so how do we go from that information into some sort of, uh, you know, information packages that tell us something about the ice sheet? And it's what we call the inversion procedure. And it's a system devised by Kleeman uh, back in the 80s. It basically goes like this. <clears throat> you know, we, you have two ways that you can think about landforms. One is, you know, the forward path is like you have ice sheets. Ice sheets move and, you know, change the landscape. So they basically generate landforms. You know, and the questions we do in, we then place is like, you know, how does that happen? You know, and, and we, you know, how do we go about it? Well, you know, how do we do it? You know, we make direct observations. We go to ice sheets and measure, you know, so it's measurements. This is all short time scale, you know, a near marginal environment because we can't get to the subglacial environment. We're basically looking at individual landforms. And this is all about process thinking, right? I mean, how does it happen? How can I measure? You know, how can I infer all that? And then you have the other way, which is what we are doing now in the paleoglaciology. We have the landforms, the ice is all gone, and we're going to say something, you know, how can we reconstruct ice sheets from this? You know, how, how can we learn about them? So, you know, the question is not how does it happen? It's like, you know, how shall we do this? How shall we proceed? And the keywords are rather different from these. You know, there's like, okay, we have a lot of landforms. It's a patchy record. It's not continuous. Lots of data, enormous data volume. So we need to do some data reduction to make sense. You know, you can't just deal with 200,000 landforms. These are formed over a long time scale. You know, and they could be the formation of a month, but we don't know if that month is, you know, 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years or 100,000 years ago. So we have to deal about long time scales. We need to make the genetic assumptions that come from this part. And then uh, we do some landscape classification. You know, we basically bundle all this together into, you know, some sort of a group thinking. And of course, this is all, it's not so much about process as in geographical thinking. We have maps and we need to make, you know, deductions on how ice sheets have behaved. So I'll take you through some of this. So we look at that this, this, the fact that it's a patchy record, lots of data, and that we need to do data reconstruction. And I return to this area in Northern Sweden from which you've already seen a map. And if you go and just do the mapping, you know, and just map every, everything you can see, then you get maps like this. Well, it's, it's a smaller part of that Northern Swedish landscape. Uh, for some of you who have been there, this is the city of Kiruna, it's the biggest city, and here you see the Norwegian-Swedish border. So we're in northern Sweden, and basically what you see here is only two landforms. It's one landform in two directions, I, sh I should say. It's, it's drumlins, and it's drumlins that are either in a sort of uh, northeast-southwest direction or in a northwest-southeast direction, basically 90 degrees difference in, in direction. So you basically see that there's two systems and you know now we've colored them in that map that you saw from Clayman from 97 that everything was just black and so you know you don't see that color here coloration but this is just too much to you know you can't represent this on a on a scale that is of you know let's say a complete ice sheet because this is just a very small corner so we can just conclude that this is an enormous data volume and so we need to do something about that this is that same area, but now represented on the map by Hetterstrand from 1998. And again, you see, you know, you see the ice flow that is in the in this direction, as well as you see the ice flow in this direction. You no know, prominent in this corner, and not so prominent in here, but it comes through all through. So this is a representation of that, you know, enormous data vo volume in, into something that is, you know, you could start trying to analyze in conjunction with other landforms that are also on this map. So what we've done here is taking that you know, really detailed every landform to, you know, where every landform you see on this map maybe represents 
20 or 50 you know, similar landforms in the former mapping that you saw. So here we've done a lot of data reduction. And you know, if, you if you take this back even further to the full you know, glaciated landscape scale, then you're getting to this map from McLean Mountain from 1997, you know, based on aerial photographs. So basically these are all these, so you, you can see now all these scratches here, all these, all these the, the drumlins that are mapped here, they are representative of, you know, 50s to perhaps hundreds of drumlins with the same direction. Um, so it becomes a really, you, you need to think about the fact that this, you know, of this scale, it really is a representation of what is on the, on the, on the ground. And, you know, you can zoom into that same area that we've just looked at in this map, and then you're getting this, basically this area. So again, you see this, you know, the one that is going from the northeast to the southwest, or actually bus, of course, flow from the southwest to the northeast, and from the northwest to the southeast. So both of these are represented in this map as well. And you know this is kind of the, the the scale, the reduction that you need to do to present it at a at a scale of you know a publication like this in a in a regular journal. <clears throat> well, the next step is then, you know, what does this all mean, right? I mean, we 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 have now shown you how we do that with let's say drumlins, but we, for all these landforms, we might need to have to make you know uh, this kind of data reduction and 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 simplification um, patterns. Um, now we need to go to the next phase, you know, the, the genetic assumptions that we have and what does it mean for landscape classification. Well, first of all, we need to think about that all these landforms, they were formed by ice sheets, right? And ice sheets is, is a simple system, right? I mean, if you just zoom out from an ice sheet, you know, and, 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 and Antarctica, you know, let's say a couple of thousand kilometers across and, uh, or, you know, a couple of, yeah, and, you know, a, a couple of kilometers thick, you know, so it's basically one to several thousand or so in, in, in scale, you know, so if you zoom out, it basically becomes a line, right? And so it means that ice flow in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ice sheet is just parallel and, and outward. So you, when you then think of landforms, you, you expect that at some point when the ice forms landforms, they're all parallel in the direction of flow or transverse. But, you know, if you look at parallel formation, then they should be strictly parallel. So you can then go to, you know, patches of landforms and you can see, you know, all these landforms, they're all strictly parallel. Okay, they could all belong to, you know, an ice that was going, let's say, from the bottom to the top, especially if some of them have arrows. So we know what the ice flow direction was. So we know it was from the bottom of to, to the top. And, you know, what is the minimum representation of that ice sheet that we can think of, right? Is, is, is what is, what is, what is the, 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 the question. What we see in this then is that there's one ice flow pattern that goes like this, right? That is what these are. And then we see this pattern here. It has this, and it's kind of slightly diverging. And here we also see a slightly diverging pattern. Of course, I mean, if you go from an ice in the center and it becomes a really big ice sheet, then basically ice goes outwards, you know, it's parallel, but slightly outwards. So you could get this divergent pattern. So that would be another, you know, glaciologically plausible pattern. So basically these are two patterns that where we would then say these two probably fit together. You know, we don't have the evidence of it in the middle, but they, they form a similar pattern. So basically you have two patterns. So then we can take these patches, this and this, and then we can say, okay, you know, ice laterally, if there was ice flow here, then it must, in the side, there must be ice on the side. So it's just, you know, there must have been ice in here. And if there was ice out here, then there must have been ice out here. And so basically getting the minimum representation, a fan, you know, there must have been ice in this box in order to get this pattern. As well as these, you know, there must have been ice in this box in order to get this pattern that we find in the field. So basically making these kind of fans that, that make glaciological good sense. So that's the first representation. Then we, so basically now I have all these landforms and then now make fans of all of them. So get a representation. Then we need to think about what kind of fans do we have? As, you know, what, what, what sort of fans do we have? And this is basically the, um, the different types of fans that we, Recognize. I'm not going to go through every one of them, but just a, a couple of them. The first one, the wet bed deglaciation envelope. So basically, like I said, most of what we see is for when the ice was at its largest and, and decreases to, you know, very small dimensions and finally disappears. So the shrinking of the ice sheet, the deglaciation. And as it does, it leaves these landforms, you know, free of ice, uh, and basically an imprint of the deglaciation all over the landscape. That's what we call the envelope. You know, it, it envelopes all of the landscape. And it, by and large, it was wet bed. You know, the ice was sliding. 
And what do we see? Well, we see we get the lineation as ice is sliding and we get the eskers. So if lineation patterns and esker patterns are pat parallel, because eskers form perpendicular to the ice margin, right? And so that means also parallel to lineations that are also parallel to ice flow. So if these two are co-occurring and parallel, then we know that we have to do with a deglaciation pattern. So the deglaciation envelope. We could also have a cold-based dry bed deglaciation envelope. Well, then we don't get any lineations and we don't get much of an esker pattern either because the, the water can't find its way to the bottom of the ice as we saw. But we do get a lot of meltwater features and basically only meltwater features. So all of a sudden you may go from, you know, lots of eskers and, and, and lineations parallel and, and as the ice decreases, perhaps all of a sudden you have none of those and what you see are lateral channels. And then you know that you go from a wet bed to a dry bed deglaciation. Well, you might find just lineations and no eskers. That means that you're far away from the margin of the ice. You're in underneath the ice. Ice is flowing. It's wet bed. It, it makes lineations, but there are no eskers. So you're inside the ice. So you can make all these combinations and learn, you know, where within the ice must we be and what, how shall we interpret this? So, so that's how we sort of make these sort of ice flow packages and give them a genetic uh, content. Well, now we have these packages, we give them genetic content. Now we need to kind of put them into an order, right? So the, the, we need to determine the relative ages of these. Uh, and for relative ages, we have basically two ways of doing it. It's either superposition or cross-cutting. Um, and here you see an example of cross-cutting where you, know, you have striation patterns in one direction, cross-cut where these cut through these these uh, striation directions of, of older age. So these are the younger ones, and these are the older ones. This is a, a, a stone pavement that I've collected in Arctic Canada, where you know one direction was really prominent, but the very last thing the ice did was from 90 degrees different direction. So you know it gives us at that point where it was sampled very good in, in chronological information of what was old and what was young. Well, the relative age of re relative age relationships, we have already looked at a few of them. One, for example, would be drumlins on top of drumlins. We've seen this uh, this satellite imagery when I told you that you know there is you know you can clearly see drumlins in this direction. But if you think about it, there's two patterns. There's basically you see all these elongated lakes in this direction. You see that basically there is a very coarse, very large drumlinization in this direction that has been overprinted by younger drumlinization in this direction. So basically we have two systems here, an old direction in this direction where there are landforms that are you know, 10 times or maybe even hundred times as large as the younger, which is that one. So here we also have a cross cutting relationship or in this case superposition because the, you know, it's not really cutting through but uh, deposited on top. So it's superposition of drumlins on top of drumlins. You can have flutings on top of drumlins. There's a nice example here from northern Sweden, where we have basically a, a you know very light touch-up of the slopes in one direction in on a drumlin, which is a, you know, a very long direction in this. So it's also again at about 90 degrees. Um, and basically, we're back to this imagery from Chris Clark from 1993, when you know basically have one drumlin system that is you know in, in basically being touched up with another, and then you can still recognize both. And in the end, maybe you just see one of them, right? But that's the superposition idea. Well, another one that we can clearly see is eskers on top of underlying morphology. So we can see that eskers may have, you know, it, because it's on top of something deposited on top of a drumlin or so, you can see that, you know, the drumlin is older and the, 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 the esker that's deposited on top is, is, uh, is, is younger. You can also see meltwater channels that cut uh, morphology, for example, an esker. So this is an example from northern Sweden where, you know, you have a winding esker ridge here in the landscape. You know, it's sitting on top of other landforms, you know, to which this is younger. And so the other landforms are older and it itself is cut by a large meltwater gap. You know, it's basically, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's cut as, as water was running off the ice, you know, along the margin, it destroyed and that bridge it just produced. And, and this is the youngest, you know, glacial imprint on that on that land, landscape in this particular case, and tells us something about the location of an ice margin, which 
by itself, of course, the ESCO also, also, also gave us. But it says something about what is older and what is younger. And then, of course, finally, we have cross-cutting stria, of which there is so many observations in glaciated, formerly glaciated landscapes. So, you know, you can, of course, um, collect these and, you know, map them and get really good, you know, relative age relationships between different sets of stria. And oftentimes you see that these then also correlate with drumlin patterns in other places. So, you know, you, they, 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 they usually do that. Not always, but, but usually they, they do. So this gives us then the possibility of, of stacking things, you know, in, in, in time chronology. Well, that of course is, is, is kind of good, but you know, what you really want is of course, trying to pinpoint exactly when it happened. And this is really difficult. Subglacial time is basically undateable, but marginal time. So when was the ice margin somewhere is in, 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 uh, in good conditions, maybe dateable. And the several different dating techniques for that. Before I get that, this is basically what you see. This is the, these are these flow packages that you get. If you know, if you stack all that, this is the, basically the lineation system. If you stack that in different packages and, you know, combined with the eskers and, and what have you not, you know, so if, if eskers and lineation systems are parallel, then they're called, they're in a deglaciation uh, fan or, or, of, of sorts and so, and so forth. So the, here we have everything packaged in fans and they have cross-cutting relationships. You'll see a map in, a, in, the, in, the, next, uh, in the next slide, a, a large map of this, so you see it better. Um, so these are now chronologically stacked, you know, relative stacked to each other, um, but they don't have a, an, an, an absolute time stacking yet. And, and you know, to do that, they're basically different ways. And one, the first one I want to look at is correlation. Um, so, here is that map, you know, we know that, you know, there is something, some that we call deglaciation fans. Some of them were the synchronous fans where, you know, you lack eskers, so they are inside the ice. You know, here you see the numbers of all these packages, you know, they're all numbered, so we know where they are and, and what kind of, you know, so then, then we can start, you know, painting pictures with these. I mean, you know, if you have a deglaciation fan here, and it, it, you know, you can basically trace it into the final deglaciation, but you have another fan, which deglaciation fan, which doesn't really jive with that. Then you mean that you have two deglaciations, you know, and, and in some places they are of course parallel. You could never tell in some places there's an angular difference between them and you can tell. So for example, we can, from that, we can see that, you know, there must be a time earlier before the last deglaciation when there was a, an earlier deglaciation from an ice, ice sheet that was really centered on the mountain. So a mountain ice sheet. Um, and, the, you know, there's a deglaciation pattern that doesn't fit the last deglaciation, so it must be older. Well, then you can start thinking about, you know, when may that have happened during the last glacial cycle? You know, is it, it's not the, the deglaciation from, you know, MIS-2 to MIS-1, marine isotope stage 2 to marine isotope stage 1. It must be earlier sometime, uh, you know, and, and could it be, you know, from phase 5D to 5C or, you know, something like that. And so we, you know, we try to find arguments to put that stack into some sort of a through correlation with, in this case, the deep sea oxygen or the, the ice core, oxygen isotope curves into a, an, an, an absolute uh, chronology. And then you can make cartoons like that. So this is, you know, the, the cartoon of these, of these uh, flow patterns um, in, you know, as through time. So, you know, the, 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 that you would have started out with a, a mountain ice sheet that would have grown to larger proportions during stage four, the full proportion during marine isotope stage two, the LGM, and then a deglaciation pattern. Okay, now, now we have these, you know, now, now we have used our paleoglaciology, the landforms to say what happened to the ice sheet. What do we think from the geomorphology and the sedimentology, what happened to the ice sheet? This is the 2D interpretation. What does it tell us about 3D, right? We don't know that yet, but we could do that through ice sheet modeling. So you now we have now in intensively looked at the data from the Fennoscandian domain, but you know, there's equally good research done in the, in the Northern, in the, uh, on the British Isles, in, in what we've called here the Celtic domain and less so, but also some data from the Barents and Kara Sea region. And this was at maximum glaciation. This was one big ice center. 
you know, it started out as three different ones and then, you know, merged and then broke up again in three different ones. So this is the model domain that we will, you know, look at and, and see what happened. So this is a, a reconstruction from, um, see if I can get this going. Uh, yeah, there. Um, so now you, what you see here is the forcing. So we go from 37,000 years ago to 8,000 years ago. So you're basically going from before the last glacial maximum to the last glacial maximum, then into the Holocene. Um, so we have the climate forcing from the ice core and you have a sea level forcing, which is at lowest during the LGM. And so the ice sheet is of course sensitive both to sea level and to climate. So it's, 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 it's forced by both. You can follow the, the temperature according to the forcing, the sea level, and as sea level changes, you see that more and the more dry land or less dry land happens. And you can see the volume of the uh, ice sheet through time. So this gives us now a 3D um, impression of, 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 of the ice sheet. See if that, uh, no, let's see what happens. Uh, how do I get out of this? Uh, Okay, I will stop share for a second to see if I can get this to and come back again with sharing. Um, okay. Um, okay, back again. I hope this is still visible for you all. So now you see this, the ice sheets growing towards, you see here the, the progress towards the last glacial maximum. You see how it grows. The light colors are fast flowing, uh, blue colors are slow flowing. Um, you see how the, the ice sheets are still separated. This is the first connection between these two ice sheets. This is still, this only connects during the LGM and then it, breaks up again. Here you see what we deduce from the geomorphology is the maximum flow. And you see it doesn't quite attain that maximum in this, uh, in this model run. And you get a history of the volume of the ice sheet and the elevation of the ice sheet by modeling. And that's something that we can't get to by just the geomorphology. So you need the modeling and then you need to construe the modeling against the field evidence. And so, you know, just to get you a flavor of what you might do with that. So for example, you could look at the model, you know, you get a different time snaps of a model you can look at, you know, how well does it conform with, you know, here you see all these small ice flow bits and pieces that are like uh, these uh, flow. Um, let me see if I can get back my laser pointer again. So um, you see all these, you know, these flow packages, they are out in here, uh, you know, and then you can see how well do they behave, you know, as to ice flow direction in a model. Um, and in, in some models, you know, some of those uh, time slices, they fit better. You know, for example, for this package here, you need it really to go to this particular time to make it happen. Whereas in this time, you know, you would see the ice flow would be at, 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 at odds for this package. So you can, you know, pinpoint times when the flow packages are conceivable according to the modeling. And you can also say that the modeling does a good job if it can, you know, recreate all the different ice flow directions, then that, that, that is, gives you some, uh, uh, some confidence then. Um, okay, this is another one, you know, here we can model and we can say, when does the ice flow stop? Or when, no, when does the margin stop? So it, you know, it's not retreating and not advancing, it's standing still. These are excellent times to build these end moraines. You know, when the ice margin is stationary for thousands of years or, or hundreds of years and, you know, leaves all that material that it's transporting at its margin, you're getting these ridges. You know, that would be a way to look at. So here we see the imprint of, you know, when the ice is standing still more than a thousand years to, you know, 500 years is the yellow ones to, you know, the green, green uh, colors, which basically there's no standstill. Um, and you can then, you know, can make a map of that which would be here. So these would be different ice margins according to the standstill. And you can compare that. Now you need to 
flip that, you know, you need to think of it as a, you need to do, rotate it 90 degrees to compare with this map, but you're getting an idea that, you know, these outer, these outer moraines, you know, must kind of uh, equate to the ones that we've mapped in here. And they are not one-to-one, -one, but it shows that the modeling modulates that the ice was standing still at different positions, perhaps not at the perfect places yet, but it, you know, it, 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 it does give you that represent representation at least. Um, one can look at, uh, you know, the, 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 outer, the outer margin of the ice sheet and asks the question of when is any of these, if ever, are they being obtained, you know, through modeling? And so here is an, here's another representation that so you can see, you know, you can look at the ones that in the west, the western moraines, so three, four, one, two, three, four, five. Um, is these, these one, two, three, four, five. And then you can see over the last 37,000 years, when does the ice actually meet the criteria of being at these positions? And you can see that, you know, there's for the green one, for example, which is, um, which is four, is this one here. So this one, for example, you know, is, is, is attained several times during, you know, 29 and 26 and 24 and 22. So there's a large certainty that this could, you know, has happened even several times that the ice margin was there. Whereas, you know, we, we can see that some of them, you know, like the pink one here is only happens once during the whole modeling sequence is, you know, right around 26,000 years, the ice margin was there. So we can see again, you know, and then perhaps if we get more information on when that happened from other data, we can compare and see how well that happens. Um, so that's another way of checking, you know, how robust the modeling is. A third way of looking at it is at the, looking at the subglacial temperatures. Um, so here is the, uh, the, the, the imprint of uh, the subglacial temperature in, uh, in, you know, from the maximum and um, the potential, because of the subglacial temperatures, you're getting erosion, right? And so the more flow, the warmer, the more erosion you get. And the least flow or where it's cold based, zero erosion. So you go from permanently cold based, which is this area in here, um, to you know where there was quite a bit of flow and therefore erosion. Now you can compare that with you know the mapping that we've done in our from geomorphology of landscapes that are relict. So they have not seen much glacial erosion at all or not at all. And what is not at all are the darkest colors in here. Um, so and that pattern is now overlain in this. So it's this red one. And you see that where there's no erosion at all according to the geomorphology. And this is basically no erosion throughout all of the glaciations, not just the last one, but all of the glaciations. But the last one also clearly mimics that. That's where you're getting the darkest colors. So that it's a good general. Um, as a, it seems to give a good representation of that the modeling. And finally, of course, you can look at the uh, the flow uh, of the impoundment of lakes um, and so marginal positions. Um, see and so basically you know that gives us because these impoundments of the lakes you know it gives us basically the where ice margins need to be and has given us this pattern of you know the the ice flow contours right i mean it's one of these final ones that gives us the ice flow contours here it is end moraines as you can clearly see um but in here it's the ge purely geomorphology and some of these are also the the meltwater published. So, so whereas we have this pattern well constrained, we don't quite know yet from this pattern what the timing of all this is. And for that, of course, you need different types of, uh, of, of, um, different types of, of dating. Um, so in this, in this study, we've used, you know, published age constraints. And what we use in these formerly glaciated regions are basically three main techniques of absolute dating. It's called radiocarbon dating, where we use uh, uh, decayed uh, carbon rich material to, de to determine the age. Cosmogenic nuclides, which is an, an age technique whereby uh, the incoming cosmic rays change the chemistry of rocks, and we can use that change in chemistry to tell time. And optically stimulated luminescence, which is basically tells us the burial of uh, silt and sand rich material, uh, 
so when that silt, silt the sand rich material becomes buried and you know isolated from uh, sun exposure that that clock starts ticking so we have different you know we can use uh, radiocarbon material we can use rocks we can use sediments to tell something about you know when things happened and that's part of that the the uh, the the age constraints in this uh, in this reconstruction we also have something that's called uh, uh, over, and we use also correlations with the um, with the um, uh, with the ice core stratigraphy, and I show you a, 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 a slide on that in a second. And then we have something that is called the Swedish timescale VARF chronology, and, and Stefan will talk more about that as we go uh, as we go into the next lecture. Um, but these are the chronological constraints that we used in this particular study to you know go from that retreat line to also telling time. And so you know you see there's both you know there's luminescence dating in some regions so it's here and here but for most of the areas not there's radiocarbon date throughout basically from uh, lake sediments and again uh, Stefan will tell a little bit more about that and then we have cosmogenic isotope dating from you know displaced rocks or bedrock uh, where the ice uh, can be dated to have uh, left the site and so it become ice free and the rock being exposed to cosmogenic nuclides to uh, cosmogenic rays. So on the southern uh, peninsula, I told you there was a whole array of end moraines. And for the end moraines to happen, the ice must stop. It must stop retreating, stand still, or perhaps a slight re-advance. Re and you know, available dating is insufficient to really pinpoint all of them, but some of them. Uh, and wh what we've done is then, in addition, related these still stands to equally many cold periods in the ice core record. So where we have six moraines, we also have six cold periods in the ice core record. And so where for some of them, we know that they overlap and such as, you know, the, the younger Dryas and the middle Swedish and moraine zone, as well as the Holland coastal and, uh, and uh, this period. So we know some, we know, and then once in between, we just figure that, you know, the times when this would have happened is when the, it was so cold that the ice start, stopped re retreating. And so they, they then date uh, towards these. So that's part of the reconstruction as well. Then we have these bars that uh, are sediment pack packages, uh, light and darker layers of, uh, of uh, proglacial sediment that are being deposited um, during winter and summertime. Um, they tell us something about the retreat of of the uh, of the, of the glacier on very very detailed scales. You know, this is these are uh, twenty year retreat distances on this graph, and so you know you, we basically have an ice margin representation of the retreat of the ice sheet going back from about thirteen thousand four hundred years to about nine thousand nine hundred fifty years along the coasts along the Baltic coast because this was deposited in the in the in the uh, in the in the uh, proglacial depression of the of the, of the Baltic, um, and again, uh, Stefan will talk a little bit more about that in his lecture on the you know the the, the quaternary geology uh, following ice sheet deglaciation. So basically, that brings us to this uh, final imagery um, of you know how the ice sheet fluctuates um, between. You know it, its maximum and minimum config configurations um, during the deglaciation, and so basically when we get to these outer limits, it's basically the dates, cosmogenic nuclides dates uh, on on these on these moraines. When we get to the uh, here is the partly the the reconstruction with the um, uh, with the uh, Greenland ice core record. Um, and then when we come in here, just north of that, we have our VARV record all the way up in here. Now, as we can date each of these chrono lines, you know, basically along this transect, and because we tell from the geomorphology uh, that, you know, ice flow, because ice flow has to be parallel or slightly divergent, um, we can basically if we if we if we know that at some point the ice uh, here was 12,000 years ago, then it, then we basically can contour it further to be you know true all around, 
and that's what this this is uh, is basically based on. So it's it's not a dating based reconstruction, but geomorphology based reconstruction. And there are also dating based reconstructions to which this gives a very similar representation. So it's um, it, it, it's nice to see that uh, in it, at least on the Scandinavian Peninsula, the dating based reconstructions and the geomorphological based reconstructions converge very well. <coughs> So I here I have another representation of that model. Uh, let's see if I can get this going somehow. Uh, yeah. So here you see ice flow lines on top of the um, the ice sheet reconstruction, as I showed you before. Um, this is from a longer run. Now we've run we've run it all through the last glacial cycle, but that, it takes an awful long time to look at that. Um, but this is again the last thirty thousand years. But what you see, what I want you to see here is how you know you have these ice flow lines. They come from really you know the, the what we in, interpret have been always cold based divide area, and they are they go far back. So if you think about runoff from this ice sheet, you know as it is melting. It really is a large area that you know water is accumulating along the margin of this ice sheet, um, and I, I get to that in the next slide. So just that you have a feeling on how um, that the 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 ice sheet is highly asymmetric. You know, with a high just above, just east of the mountains. And you know the the ice flow going all the way down into uh, Poland and uh, and Germany, and here you see also very well how the ice margin is you know is is retreating and advancing, and then and after the Younger Dryas, which happens right now right here, then this is the last final advance, and then you're getting the continuous retreat towards the final deglaciation. So it really gives you a very uh, truthful in, in, uh, picture of of that glacial cycle. Um, let's see. So <clears throat> this is the uh, an, in, in, uh, an impression of that the full glacial extent of the ice sheet, uh, and on top of it, we've we've uh, envisaged the uh, water routing that would have happened. You know, we know the mass balance of the ice sheet as we are modeling it forward in time, you know, it, it will have to have a, a mass balance to grow. And, 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 you know, that is then coupled, as I showed you with the, uh, the ice core record from uh, Greenland. Um, so if you look at the mass balance, then we know that, you know, there's melting across that ice sheet and you're basically seeing the extent of what that, you know, the summer melt would have been um, and the runoff that happens. And it all, you know, it, it, it all, uh, accumulates along the margin. You know, that's how you're getting the, the, the landforms that we've been talking about, the, the marginal landforms, uh, channels and so forth. It basically created the biggest river that Europe has seen. Um, and it, it exited, you know, the, the mainland through the channel uh, that is uh, now south of the British Isles. So at the time when the, the glaciation started, this was just a peninsula. This was just, you know, this was just part of, of Europe. It wasn't an island as such. It became an island because of the erosion by rivers, uh, you know, through what is now the English Channel. And the river is be to, has been termed the Fleuve Manche. Um, and it basically combined, you know, the big rivers, the Rhine and the Meuse and the Thames, the, the, the Thames and the, the Seine. And the Elbe and the Vistula, so it, it really gets its water from way back uh, east. During deglaciation, when this ice is retreating, these lakes that you see in this corner, you know, become even bigger. They become really big because this the drainage here is also towards the uh, the uh, the Arctic Ocean, and these these became really big lakes that overflowed at times, you know, also further towards the south. So there's a lot of water that is running, and this is not just true for the Fennoscandian or the, the Scandinavian ice sheet complex. It's equally true for the North American ice sheet where you had you know, these big lakes, where you now have the, the Great Lakes in uh, America. There was you know, big lakes uh, that, were, that were dammed and that were flowing into the North Atlantic. And you know, the outbursts of some of these lakes have again been credited to have, for example, caused the Younger Dryas cooling. 
Um, so and and other cooling periods. So as much of that cold water then enters the North Atlantic, it kind of kind of of course can disrupt the flow of the North Atlantic, and with that, the heating pump that is that it that it that it represents. As I'm sure you're well aware that you know we scientists are looking carefully to the North Atlantic today in order to see if it's you know if it's decreasing in strength, and with that we might expect you know decreasing heat being brought to our latitudes, and with that perhaps rather than warmer, colder conditions in the future. So just to tie this, you know, this kind of glacial uh, term landscape, you know, the Scandinavian Peninsula to something that, you know, it has affected a lot of the landscapes that we've seen perhaps in, in mainland Europe, where, you know, the, 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 the drainage of all, this, all these river systems into one and the same uh, outlet uh, south of the, uh, of the uh, British Isles. Yeah, this is well basically the reconstruction part of the of this uh, lecture series. Basically, we're going to give uh, the word to Stefan in a while. You know, he will have a look at the climate ice sheet interactions. Uh, you know, talk a little bit about both glacial environmental changes that you get uh, on the Baltic uh, and the importance of some of the datings. And he will look mostly at ashes and varves in his uh, in his lecture. And there's more. I haven't revealed everything that's in. Stefan's lecture. So I would say stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, I'll hand this over to you for a while, Stefan. Okay, thank you very much, Arjen. I think we will maybe have a break now. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Yep. It's uh, seven minutes enough. I think so. So we continue at 12.50 with, with the last lecture. And then after that, we can have a um, questions to both me and to Arjen. But we continue in six minutes at 12.50. Okay. Okay, so it's now it's 1250 in Stockholm and in Europe, so we will continue with the second part of this webinar from Stockholm University. My name is Stefan Vastigård, a colleague of Arjen, and I will uh, focus now on the quaternary stratigraphy and the climate de development of Scandinavia. And I will talk a little bit also about some data methods that can be used for reconstructing the ice margin, for example, that is VAR chronology that already has been mentioned by Arjen and also Tefra chronology. So I think I start with a short presentation of myself. I hope you can hear me well. Just shout out if you cannot do that. So here am I, I'm here standing at in Yukon in Canada actually some years ago. I'm professor in, in uh, quaternary geology at Stockholm University, which means at I'm mostly interested in, in the climate development and environmental change during the quaternary period, which is the last 2.6 million years that you are probably familiar with. And I worked quite a lot the last 20 to 25 years with volcanic ashes and, and a dating method which is based on volcanic ashes, which is called tephrochronology. And I will talk to you a little bit later about that towards the end of my lecture. And I have ongoing and past projects in Scandinavia. We're also working with North Atlantic cores and I've done some projects in the Azores and also in Patagonia. So mainly in areas where you can actually find deposits from volcanic eruptions. So first you have seen a lot of pictures of the Scandinavian ice sheets. And this is just one example of that. And what you can see in a picture like this is that you have an ice sheet over Scandinavia. It's sometimes connected with the British ice sheet, but you will also show 
or see here that it's quite evident that there is a lot of water that's stored in, in the, these ice sheets, which means that the global sea level stands at a much low, lower level than at present. So during the last glacial maximum, for example, 20 to 21,000 years ago, the global sea level was at a low stand of around maybe up to 150 meters lower than at present, which means that you have land bridges between the British Isles and continent, for example, but also between Siberia and uh, Alaska at the Bering State, for example. You also have the ice dam lakes south of the ice margin, between the ice margin and the continent. And you have uh, conditions like polar desert or tundra or steppe environments in most parts of Europe. You can probably call this a mammoth steppe that extends all the way from Ireland in the west towards through Siberia and all the way to North America. And around the Mediterranean, where I know that most many of you are sitting now, there are areas with uh, more parkland environments, even forests in some areas. And the type of vegetation that we have in Scandinavia today actually survived in refugia areas around the Mediterranean during the last ice age. So, but I will focus now on Northwest Europe and especially Scandinavia. We heard a lot from Arjen how you can use different landforms to reconstruct the behavior of the ice sheet and also using uh, climate models to do that. So I'm a quaternary geologist and I'm working with the quaternary time period, which is the youngest ongoing uh, geological time period. It started 2.588 million years ago, and it's still ongoing, apparently. And it's usually, or it's been traditionally divided into two different epochs. One is the Pleistocene, which is the longest one. It ended 11,700 years before two, year 2000. And the Pleistocene consists of three different parts, the early, middle, and the late Pleistocene. But we are now living in an interglacial, which is called the Holocene, which started 11,700 years before year 2000. That's meant by B2K. And the Holocene has quite recently been formally divided into three different parts. You can see the paper actually published just in two years ago, where the Holocene was divided into three different parts, the early, middle, and the late Holocene. Early at uh, the transition to the middle Holocene was at 8.2 Ka, and the transi transition to the late Holocene was 2000, is now defined as 4,200 years before present. But you have probably also heard about, about the, the Anthropocene, the sort of geological time period that is affected by humans. Is it still, it's not yet a formally decided um, geological time period but that will probably be decided in 2021. So you will hear, probably hear more about the Anthropocene if it's going to be formalized and especially where the base of the Anthropocene will be set. So that's the Quaternary. And if we look at the Quaternary, what defines the Quaternary? One thing that is very prominent in the Quaternary is the recurrent glaciation in the both hemispheres both in the Southern and the Northern Hemisphere, and that we have very well-preserved deposits from the Quaternary, both on land, in the oceans, and in glaciers, ice sheets. Uh, the Greenland ice sheets goes back something like 130,000 years, but the ice, the oldest ice in Antarctica is approximately 2 million years old. And there are now efforts trying to core back as far uh, as possible time-wise in the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, this is a relatively short time period, so the continental drift that's all, always ongoing has been less than 100 kilometers. But on the other hand, we have very rapid sea level changes during the Quaternary, up to around 150 meters, uh, because there have been a lot of water stored in the huge ice sheets in North America and Europe, for example. We have the damming of ice lakes, and eventually these ice lakes are, are drained down to the sea level 
and they can inject huge amounts of, of uh, fresh water into the oceans that can affect, for example, the North Atlantic current. And that's something that's been uh, happened during the Younger Dry Scope period. At least that's one of the possible explanations for that. Uh, we had redistribution of rocks of sediments. We can found, uh, find uh, Swedish rocks, so to say, in the continent, uh, transported there by the glaciers. We have a megafaunal extinction on all, all the continents that you're pro probably familiar with. I will not go into any detail here, but we have the extinction of the mammoths, the uh, rhinoceros, and so on um, in all continents. And there's been a lot of discussions about the reasons for that, if it's due to human overhunting or if it's due to uh, climate changes. And I think the consensus among many scientists now that it is actually a combination of those both things. Okay. Um, there have been also rapid evolution of the hominids during the Quaternary time period starting already before the Quaternary with a species called Australopithecus afarensis in Africa, another one called Homo naledi in, also in Africa. I think this one is Homo erectus. And the last one is probably Homo sapiens. I think you are familiar with that one. So a very rapid evolution of the hominids during the Quaternary time. Some years ago, uh, this climate curve was uh, published by Burke and others, and this shows the climate evolution during the last 65 million years. So it goes back to the extinction of the dinosaurs at the transition from the Cretaceous into the Paleogene. And we can see here that, uh, well, we can first see that uh, the temperature scale here is re in relation to the present temperature of, of Earth. So most of the time between 65 and sort of 3 million years ago, it's been warmer than at present. We can also see that the change, uh, the scale changes here. So here is 20 million years be between each dash here, but here we have hundreds of thousands of years. And we are now here somewhere in, in the historical time period, 25. And this is what we might see into the future when we are going due to the climate warming, we will end up, might, we might end up in temperatures up to five to 10 degrees warmer than at present. And then we'll come back to this. You can also see that there have been ice sheets in the Southern hemisphere from approximately 35 million years and ice sheets in the Northern hemisphere from three to 4 million years back possibly a little bit late, earlier than that. And they might actually disappear here sometime into the future. So this is the quaternary time period. This is actually the end of a cooling that started already 50 million years ago. And towards the present, we get more and more higher swings in the temperature. This is from the Greenland ice cores the Antarctic ice cores, and we also have quite a high amplitude in the changes from very cold conditions to warm conditions. This is one example, 130,000 years ago, we had the past, the latest integration, the Eemian integration that I will come back to. So we have been going from a greenhouse into a nice house during the last 50 million years. If you look at the Southern Hemisphere, for example, 35 million years ago, we still had beech trees, trees of the Southern uh, beech, Notophagus in Antarctica, first localized, started to develop, or build up 35 million years ago. And since that, we have had an increased ice in Antarctica. And seven to four million years back, there was also uh, evidence for uh, glaciation in the Andes in the South America. In the Northern Hemisphere, this starts later. 50 million years ago, we had palm-like trees and crocodiles. 
in the northern hemisphere on high latitudes north of the present Arctic Circle. And then we have a change in the vegetation. We get more broadleaf evergreen forest and spread of cold boreal spruce forests. And eventually the glacial ice starts to develop, first in Greenland and Alaska, seven to three million years ago, or possibly earlier than that. And it is not until more or less at the inception of the quaternary, around 2.75 million years ago, that we have significant continental ice sheets that start to appear. And the maximum ice sheets are a little bit later than that, a little bit later than 1 million years ago, 900,000 years ago, something like that. Very good evidence for that is actually that we have an iceberg uh, transported material, icebergs from ice sheets in the northern hemisphere that have brought material, gravel, stones, and so on with them. And when the icebergs eventually melt, this material is dropped down to the sea floor and can be uh, seen in an ocean course like layers with sand and gravel. So many of you are now sitting around the Mediterranean where it's probably much warmer than in Sweden today. At the start of the, uh, of the uh, quaternary some 2.6 million years ago, also some Nordic guests started to appear. And one example or two examples of that are shown here. One is the Foraminifera Hyalinea Baltica, which is now common in the western coast of Sweden, but during the early, earliest part of the Holocene, of the Quaternary, sorry, it starts to appear also in the Mediterranean Sea. We also had the development of the subpropel layers, which I will not go into any detail, but most many of you are probably familiar with them, with, and they actually reflect the Milankovitch cycles. And we have the blackish layers deposited during anoxic condition, especially during the warm and wet stages. So one important question here is of course, why does it get colder? And this is a big uh, thing to discuss. And I, I don't have time to go into much detail here. Just, but I will mention some of the explanations here that have been uh, given as an explanation of this cooling starting some 50 million years ago. One is that we have had, uh, there's evidence for decreasing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. So we have a decreasing uh, greenhouse effect during these times. Uh, in the Cretaceous, probably the carbon dioxide levels were 10 to 20 times bigger in the atmosphere than during the Quaternary. And one reason for that is that we have had a continental drift. We have uplift of mountain ranges, Himalaya, but also in North America, South America, and in Africa. And that has increased the weathering. The weathering, one uh, uh, effect of that is that there is a transport of carbon from the atmosphere to the oceans. This is a, a slow process, but it's a very persistent process that's been go ongoing during this time period. And today, also during the Quaternary, we have large land areas at critical latitudes for glaciation. And critical latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere is especially between six degrees and 70 degrees north. And Stockholm is just south of 60 degrees north. I'm now sitting on 59.3 degrees north or something like that. On top of that, we also had the feedback effects. We have the Milankovitch cycles that you're probably familiar with, but as I said, it's not much time to go into this. But I will show one example of how the Milankovitch cycle affects the growth and the decay of the ice sheets. And one is from the last glacial maximum, 21,000 years ago. And the most important uh, parameter of the Milankovitch cycles is the tilt axis, uh, especially for the growth of the ice sheets. And the tilt axis at midsummer, we have the maximum tilt towards the sun in the northern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere summer, I would say. 
And the tilt axis, uh, the maximum tilt axis, it varies between something like 21 and 24 degrees. Today, at present, we are somewhere in between. 21,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, we had a minimum solar insulation. The tilt was small. And also at the same time, we were furthest away from the sun. And that is called up helium. So we have a northern hemisphere highest growth 21,000 years ago at that time. So the ice sheets in northern hemisphere, they were large, they grew due to the low summer insulation, due to the small tilt of the earth axis, and also the longer distance to the sun. 10,000 years later, or 11,000 years later, we had the opposite conditions in the Northern Hemisphere. We were close to the Sun, we were at the closest position, perihelion, and the tilt was actually also at the maximum position. So we had a large tilt and a, and a close position, a relatively close position to the Sun. And that was the early Holocene. And then we had a rapid melting of the ice sheets in the Northern Hemisphere due to this higher summer insulation, due to the large tilt of the Earth axis and a short distance to the sun. And Milankovic, what he did was that he calculated these insulation changes. That's the amount of energy that's reached uh, uh, on different latitudes. And he showed uh, one important result of his research was that the summer insulation was most important, and especially the summer insulation on latitudes between 60 and 70s, around 75 degrees north, are most critical for the growth of ice sheets in the northern hemisphere. So this is a June solar radiation at 65 degrees north, for example, 100. 30,000 years ago, we had a very uh, high peak in summer insulation. We also had minimum ice that was during the Eemian interglacial, the last interglacial, and then during the Vaxelian or the last glacial part. We had some prominent low peaks in summer insulation. One, for example, at 70 to 60 million years ago. So there's a generally very good agreement between the summer insulation and the amount of ice in the Northern Hemisphere. So next picture shows one of the ice ages, so to say, or glaciations of glaciers in Northern Europe. And this uh, illustrates the ice age history of Northwest Europe. And we have a number of different terms for that. The blue ones are glacials and or glaciations. And the red ones are interglacials. Inter means between, between the glacials. And we are now in the Holocene. That was preceded by the Weichsel or the Weichselian glaciation. Before that, we had the Eemian interglacial, the Salian glacial. And so on. So the blue ones are the glacial glaciations and the red ones are the interglacials. And we know quite a lot about the latest ones here, especially these three glaciers and interglacials, but there is also evidence for older glaciations and interglacials, especially in the pollen stratigraphy from the Netherlands and Germany. And uh, we call them in Northern Europe. Weichsel, Sale, and Elster, the last three glaciations, but they have different names in different continents. For example, in North America, the Weichselian glaciation is called the Wisconsinan glaciation. So it's a bit confusing, actually. And uh, yes, so this uh, map shows the maximum distribution of the Weichselian ice sheet during the last glacial maximum, around 21,000 years. So we're actually going into this part now, the ice age history or the different glaciations that have affected Scandinavia. And we have uh, uh, deposits from approximately the last three glaciations in Northern Europe. 
we know from the Poland strategic free and also from marine course that there have been many more glaciations, maybe up to 40 to 50 glaciations in during the cryptography. But the deposits from these earlier quaternary glaciations are probably uh, wiped away or eroded away. So we don't have any evidence from that them in Scandinavia. And this quite old map shows the last three or four actually glaciations because the Salian glaciation is usually divided into two parts. The Vaixel or the Vaixelian, the latest glaciation is the white one here. It's actually the smallest one of these three. Did it get much further than the northern Poland, northern, northern Germany, for example? And in many parts of Europe, the Saale or the Saale ice was the largest. And that is the, this ice margin, which is uh, the ice is uh, greenish blue or something like that. And it's extended almost all the way down to the Black Sea here and covered what is today uh, where Moscow is situated. And before that, we had the Elster or the Elsterian glaciation, which in some areas in the Germany, in the Czech Republic, in Belarus, uh, was the largest ice sheet during the Kultonary. And But in many parts, the Saale ice or the Saale glaciation was the biggest ice sheet in the Kultonary, biggest, bigger than the Vaxilian glaciation that came after the Eemian integration, starting around 150,000 years ago. So, the Eemian integration, it's quite an interesting time period. We know quite a lot about that because there is a lot of sites with well preserved deposits from the Eemian. Uh, not so many in Scandinavia because uh, Scandinavia was ice covered after the Eemian, but we have some sites also with the Eemian deposits in Sweden and Finland and in this area between Finland and uh, the Baltic states here. So this is uh, a map showing the uh, Scandinavia during the Eemian. So in uh, light green, that's areas that were above the Eemian sea level. And we also have the present uh, configuration of the continents here. So you can see that this, uh, these areas in sort of darker green in Sweden and Finland were actually below or under the surface of the Indian Sea. So for example, there was an extension of the sea from the west through the Baltic Sea and all the way up to the what is called the White Sea here. And Scandinavia and Finland, Fennoscandia, so to say, was actually isolated from the continent during most parts of the Eemian. It's named after a small river in the Netherlands called Eem or Eem in English. And we know from a lot of um, investigation that the Eemian was generally warmer and wetter than the Holocene. The global sea level has been reconstructed from coral reefs in the tropics. And uh, they tell us that the global sea level was probably up to four to six meter higher than the present sea level. And there are also some investigations from the Greenland saying that the Greenland may have been very warm, may, maybe up to eight degrees warmer than the Holocene, and that the ice on, our, on Greenland may have been 25% less than today. So maybe that is something that we can, um, yeah, be an equivalent or what will happen if the global warming continues into the future. So we still, we already have a lot of melting from the Greenland ice sheet and that will uh, probably uh, continue if the global warming continues. We have some uh, nice animals like hippo, hippopotamus in the rivers in Europe and the river Thames and Rhine, sort of fossil evidence for that. There were probably no glaciers present in Europe. And we also know a lot about the vegetation of the development during the Eemian. For there's a lot of this winter green uh, plants like mistletoe, ilex, holly, 
I and so on. And also the Homo neanderthalensis, our closest cousin, were present in Europe during the Roman Invasion. So the Emian was followed by the Vaxillian glaciation. And you have already seen some of this in Aryan's talk. And this shows the ice sheet and vegetational development in Scandinavia, starting with the Emian interglacial between 130 and 115,000 years ago. Scandinavian Finland isolated from the continent. And then we have when we go into the Vaxillian, we have a number of glacial advances that have been reconstructed on the basis of glacial landforms in northern Sweden. There was one early in the Vaxillian, the first Vaxillian stadial, 150 to 100,000 years, and then another warm period when the ice was very small or confined only to the mountains. This is in the continent called the Brörup interstadial. In Sweden, it's sometimes called it the Jämtland interstadial, around 90 to 100,000 years ago. It was followed by a second uh, advance of the ice it's, that reached much further south, maybe all the way down to the Stockholm area, where I'm sitting now. And it was followed by another warm period, which is called the Oderade interstadial in the continent, or the Terende interstadial in Sweden. The Terende interstadial was a little bit colder than the Brörup interstadial, and that can be seen in this map showing different kinds of vegetation. So it's possible that southern Sweden was covered by birch forest during the Terende or Oderade interstadial, but by, with coniferous forest in there. In the stadium. So it actually took until maybe 50 or 60,000 years ago until most of Scandinavia was covered by ice during the Vaxillian glaciation. So this, there have been a lot of research efforts into this during the last maybe 20 to 30 years, and it's still under discussion. So we jump now a little bit closer to present times. There is another uh, reconstruction of the ice margin from a group in Bergen led by Anna Hughes and others. And this shows the configuration of the ice sheet in the middle vaxillium, middle to late vaxillium, marine isotope stage three to two. So for example, 34 to 38,000 years ago, once again, we had a small ice sheet confined to the mountains. Then it grew a little bit bigger. And maybe 27,000 years ago, it was probably the first time we had a connection between the British ice sheet and the Scandinavian ice sheet. And if we look at uh, findings on mammals, there have been a lot of findings on mammals in central and northern Sweden, bones and tusks and so on. And many of them have been lying around on museums and so on, and were redated by radiocarbon when the AMS technique was developed in the 1990s and early 2000s. And it turned out that many of these mammoth findings were actually dated to between 24 and 38 million thousand years ago. So there were probably a lot of mammoths running around here in Sweden and Finland at that time. But when the ice advanced again, they had to go further or move into the continent again. Next map shows the last glacial maximum around 21,000 to 20,000 years ago which is the time period when we have the greatest extent of the ice sheets in the northern hemisphere, especially when we have a connection between the Scandinavian ice sheet, the British ice sheet, and also the ice sheets over the Kara and Barents Sea in the north. Then the ice started to melt. We were actually going into a period with a higher summer insulation 
and you may have you already see this map from Arjen's presentation showing the ice margin lines starting at the last glacial maximum and then if we zoom in into southern Sweden you have already seen this showing the ice margin lines the late Vaxilian ice margin lines in south Sweden which were uh, formed during short standstills of the ice margin due to uh, climate oscillations in the climate short uh, cooling periods. Some of them are more prominent than the others, and especially the Younger Dryas ice margin zone developed between 12.7 and 11.6 thousand years ago. But there are also others named after different places in, in Western Sweden. For example, the Gothenburg or the Göteborg Moraine uh, formed at 14.7 calendar thousand years ago. And they have been mapped, for example, using LIDAR images. But some of them are also very prominent in the landscape. You don't need a LIDAR image to see the Fjäros Brekka, for example, in southwestern Sweden, which is a part of the Gothenburg or the Göteborgs Moraine, which was formed 14,700 years ago. It's uh, something like almost 50 meters high, I think, at the top. It's a road built on top of it. And we also have another famous example, which is called the Hindens Rev, which is a part of the Younger Dryas Moraines, which has been formed in the uh, around 12,300 years ago. And they are perpendicular to, they are sort, sorry, they are parallel to the ice margin, these ice marginal zones. And as I said, the most uh, prominent and most well known in Scandinavia is the Younger Dryas Moraines, named after this nice flower called Dryas or Dryas Octopetala, Mountain Avon in English, which today grows in the Swedish uh, mountains up here somewhere. And it was found actually in, in the 1870s in deposits in southern Sweden. And these deposits were also bearing a lot of other cold demanding taxa. And it was underlain and overlain by sediments with more warm, warm demanding taxa or species. And that could, the conclusion for that was that there was first a warm period, which was called the Berling under red, followed by the cold period, the Younger Dryas, and again followed by a warm period. So today, this Younger Dryas is a world, almost worldwide phenomenon, but it's nowhere as uh, prominent as around the North Atlantic region. And the Younger Dryas moraines, they can be followed around the Fennoscandian Peninsula, Finland, Sweden, Norway, you can almost walk on them all the way. And in Sweden, they're most prominent mainly in the Western part. And in Finland, we have two or three parallel lines of Younger Dryas moraines, which are called the Salpo Selke moraines. And they actually drain, or they actually, uh, yes, um, well, I lost the word here. Anyway, they are very prominent in southern Finland. And they can be up to 50 meters high, or even higher than that. Okay, I think, what is the time now? It's almost half past one. So I will end up with uh, speaking a little bit about dating methods and then we can have a little question and answer part after the lecture. And uh, to date the glaciation, Adrian already mentioned the method of varv chronology, and that's a very nice method. And um, when we used to have normal winters, it was common that I went out with colleagues, there's another PhD student, uh, to take a course from frozen lakes in winter time. And uh, that's been more difficult during the last years because the winters haven't been so cold here in Sweden. 
But actually this winter we had ice on the lakes, but it vanished very quickly just at the moment. And there have been actually some accident with people going through the ice and uh, have been drowning due because of that. Anyway, some in some circumstances you can find these barbed sediments, these banded or layered sediments. And this is clay. This is an example of glacial clay. The glacial clay was deposited on the sea bottom or the lake bottom when the ice was retreating in the Baltic Basin. So this could be Stockholm, one 11,000 years ago. This is the esker that Arjen told, talked about, which is perpendicular to the ice margin. And the coarse material, the gravel, uh, stones, sand and so on, is deposited as reaches, or as we call them eskers. And they are perpendicular to the ice margin, but there is also so a finer material uh, that's coming from the meltwater, from the glacial, and this finer material, which is usually clay and sand, is deposited on the bottom of the Baltic Sea some 11,000 years ago. In this picture, you can, you can also see icebergs that floats on the surface. And these icebergs, uh, they bring material like, and eventually this material is dropped down to the sea bottom here as drop stones. Or IRD, that's another word for that. Iceberg rafted the trites. And you might wonder, where is Stockholm? Stockholm was, of course, not built 11,000 years ago, and Stockholm was actually underwater because at that time the global sea level was much higher than it is today. So, this is a typical varved clay from the Young Dries from eastern Sweden. And the varv is a layer that consists of one dark layer and one light layer. And that represents the deposition of clay or silt during one year. And the summer layer, which is usually slightly more coarse, it has more silt particles, is the light layer. And the dark layer is the winter layer, which is usually finer and has higher content of clay particles. So if in this picture, we can probably count around 50 to 60 varves. And these are actually quite thin bars, and they were deposited during the Younger Dryas when the ice margin was at a standstill or moving very slowly. So there was very little melting, very little material coming out from the ice margin or with the melt water from the ice. Uh, if we go to the early Holocene, for example, these bars would be much thicker than during the Younger Dryas. So we had a deposition of glacial clay during the glaciation of the Baltic Basin. And this is another classic field of research in Sweden. And this is quite a complicated interplay between global sea level changes and also the isostatic rebound. Because if you put a three kilometer thick ice on top of the bedrock, the bedrock will sink. And eventually, when the ice melts, it will go back to its earlier position. And that's why we all, all we have had a land uplift all the time since the ice left Scandinavia, or actually started before that. And in many parts of Sweden, we still have a land uplift, what is called an isostatic land uplift. In Stockholm, it's around four millimeters, but further, further north in Sweden, it's up to one centimeter per year in this area. And we have also the highest coastline. That's the highest uh, point where we have had a coast during the last ice age. So this line more or less represents the highest coastline. In central Sweden or in middle Sweden, it's around 150 meters. So 
eastern Sweden, where Stockholm is, for example, has been underwater for many thousand years and eventually started to emerge from the sea, something like maybe five to six thousand years ago. And there has been the position of the glacial bars in the Baltic Sea Basin, starting with the first stage called the Baltic Ice Lake or the Baltic Skiskörn in Swedish. It was an ice lake dammed between the ice in the north and the continent in the south. And eventually this Baltic ice lake was drained in the end of the Younger Dryas when the ice uh, moved or receded north of this uh, critical point here in middle Sweden. The Baltic ice lake was dammed 25 meters above the global sea level. So there was a drainage here of the Baltic ice lake down to the level of the, of the global sea. The next stage is called the Joldia Sea. It was a brief stage with brackish conditions for around 150 years. And then eventually it ended with a transition to the next stage, the Ancylus or the Ancylus Lake stage. And it ended because these uh, straits in middle Sweden were laid dry down due to the isostatic land uplift. So we went from a lake stage a sea stage, lake stage area again during the Ancylus or the Ancylus lake stage. There was still mad ice in northern Sweden and eventually due to the global sea level rise, the sea started to, well, seawater started to get into the southern part of the Baltic Sea again, something like almost 10,000 years ago. So at present, we are in a stage which we can call the Littorina Sea stage, but it's actually changing all the time due to the isostatic land uplift. So 6,500 years ago, for example, most parts of Eastern Middle Sweden were still underwater, as well as the coasts of Northern Sweden and uh, Western Finland, for example. And during these first three stages, the Baltic Ice Lake, the Jolia Sea, the Ancylus Lake stage, we had the deposition of glacial clay starting in southern Sweden and actually still ongoing, ongoing in northern Sweden, but not due to the melt water from the ice. And this was used by a former professor at Stockholm University, he was actually the president also of the Stockholm University College. It's probably the most well-known Swedish quaternogeologist worldwide. It was called Jara de Jär. And he was, uh, uh, is probably most famous for the development of this updating method. <coughs> and in the 1800s, there was a lot of, of brick uh, factories in Sweden and uh, to make brick, it's very, useful to use clay. So there was a lot of open sections with clay. And you can see from this picture with Jara de, de Jär trying to scrape this uh, nice section with a lot of barbs. And he did field work. He, he worked with a lot of other things as well. And he noted that these banded or laminated sediments deposited in the glacial lakes. Uh, closely resembled the annual tree rings. So he suggested uh, this dating methods to date the, the glaciation of the ice sheet. And towards he, when he got old, he, know, he wrote his uh, sort of magnum opus called the Geochronologia Svesica, published in 1940, in which he wrote that from the obvious similarity with the regular annual rings of the trees, I got at once the impression that both ought to be annual deposits. And Gerard Dier, he called this annual sedimentary layers varves. And the varves is something that starts and ends in the same place. So it's a, a yearly varve, for example. And he sent out his students and a lot of other colleagues and uh, made the start of something called the Swedish time scale, which is a clay varve based time scale, starting in the southern Sweden, 
and goes uh, along the west, the eastern part of Sweden. It crosses the Younger Dryas moraines here, Stockholm, and so on. And it's connected also to Holocene Vard sediments here in the in the estuaries of some of the rivers here in northern Sweden. So this was it's not uh, it's a compilation of a lot of measurements. Actually, you don't find thirteen thousand Vards in one place. So you have to work with uh, several clavar measurements and combining them to a continuous time scale. And that was his work. And that was later uh, revised by others. Some of our teachers, Arjen and my teacher, Booströmer at Stockholm University, for example. And this was completed sometime in the 1990s. But soon after it was actually found out that there were errors in the VAR chronology, so that there are still some uh, sort of missing VARs. And that has been realized when the time scale, the clay VAR chronology has been compared with other annual based time scales like tree ring time scales and also green and ice cores. In the picture here, you see a picture of more normal VAR clays. This is here, where the summer layer is usually thicker than the winter layer. So this is one year, this is another year, and so on. So these are quite thick bars that are several centimeters thick. So just an example here from what you can do with the Claybar chronology. This is from the Swedish National Atlas, published some 20 years ago. This is from the area north of Stockholm in Gävle. It's actually there, there, the previous uh, map. And what you actually do if you are a clay bar chronologist is that you take a lot of cores with bar clay, measure the bar thickness, put a needle for each bar that consists of the summer layer, the light one, and the dark one, the uh, winter layer, and then make a graph out of that, where you have the thickness on the y-axis. This is the thickness variations, and this is the years. This is a year before Christ, which is a bit odd here, but you should you maybe use before present or something like that. And it's also very important that you try to get the first bar, the bottom bar, so to say, the bar that was deposited when the ice was actually standing here in Tidjärp or Söderfors or something like that. And the bottom varves are usually thicker because they were deposited when the ice was very close. And from these variations in var thickness, you can try to match them with each other. And you need some imagination to do that, I think, but you might eventually end up with a chronology with several matching uh, graphs here. And from that, you can make very detailed maps showing ice margin lines, the, which are the red lines here, for example. And you have also in this map, the green land uh, lines, so to say, these are different askers. So from this clay work knowledge, you can make extremely detailed uh, maps showing the deglaciation happens. But of course, you need a lot of measurements. And this is also a very time consuming method. So time is flying, but I think I will go into uh, a little bit into my speciality here, and that is tephra chronology. Tephra is another word for uh, ash, and there are almost all the time there are volcanic eruptions. There is one in Etna now in Italy and one in Sinabung in Indonesia. But I am mostly concerned with the Icelandic volcanoes because they can they erupt relatively frequently and they are quite often there is ash transported from the Icelandic eruptions. And you probably heard about this uh, famous Icelandic volcano that erupted 11 years ago called Eyjafjallajökull, which is a bit difficult to pronounce. And it was perhaps not a very huge eruption, 
compared with other eruptions in Iceland, but it caused a lot of problems with the air traffic especially. And that was because the ash cloud was directed towards Europe during the explosive phase of the eruption for around a week in April 2010. And the tephra, as I said, it comes from the Greek word. I know that many of you are actually in Greek, in Greece now. So you probably already knew, knew this. I hope it's correct. But this is solid particles uh, ejected from volcanoes in connection with explosive eruptions and transported by wind and subsequently falling to the ground. And the ground here could be ice, it could be ice cores on Greenland or the inland ice, it could be the North Atlantic sea, lakes, peaks, and so on. And the term tephra is used independent of the grain size, shape, and composition. So these particles that are transported by wind, they actually reflect the composition of the magma beneath the volcano. And the nice thing with uh, tephra is that you can actually draw lines between different climate archives. Here is an example of that, where you have two climate archives from the last ice age, from the North Atlantic, North Atlantic sediment core, polar species of uh, foraminifera. And we also have the Greenland ice core showing uh, similar pattern, actually these are called the Danske Öschker events. We have this melt major ice rafting events, the Heinrich events in the North Atlantic that you may have heard of. And as you can see on these pictures, the patterns look very similar. And it's easy to believe that they actually are similar or synchronous with each other. But it might be difficult to prove that because we don't have so many dating methods that goes back 100,000 years. And especially the Greenland ice core, it's ice, so it's very little to date there. You cannot use radiocarbon dating, for example. You can actually count the ice wars, but that gets more and more difficult when they go back into the last ice age. In the North Atlantic, you can radiocarbon date the foraminifera, but the radiocarbon dating, it's it doesn't go, doesn't go further back than around 50,000 years. And also the error margins are quite large when you go into the last ice age. But sometimes there are some layers with ash here, which are from huge eruptions on Iceland. And maybe this one is the biggest eruption during the quaternary. And this is called Ash Ashland 2. It's from, it's a, actually a number of eruptions at more or less the same time. But the biggest was from a, a volcano called, called Torvajökull on Iceland some 54,000 years ago. And it's been found, it's actually a visible layer. It's a dark blackish layer in the ice in Greenland. And also been found in a lot of uh, marine cores from the North Atlantic. And it can be used to compare and synchronize different uh, climate archives. There is another one around 10 to 12,000 years ago. And one part of this ash zone one is the Vade ash, which I will come back to in a few minutes. So I've been working with this together with colleagues in Swansea, in United Kingdom in Wales, and we have been able to find another two ash layers that's now been found both in the marine course in the North Atlantic and in the Greenland ice course. One of them was called the Fulloy Banki Tephra or the, or the Ferro Marine Ash Zone 2, and another one, the Ferro Marine Ash Zone 3, which is actually a number of uh, ash layers from more or less the same volcano. And our results, they seem to show that these changes, these major changes in between warm and cold conditions in the North Atlantic region, they are synchronous between the North Atlantic and the Greenland ice cores. 
So, as I said, you can analyze the ash particles using uh, geochemical methods. This is uh, Kamika Electron Microprobe at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. And today, or actually since the last 50 years or so, it's possible to analyze small particles down to a few micrometers big. And by looking at combinations of silica versus potassium, potassium versus titanium, for example, it's possible to distinguish ash particles from different volcanoes, in this case from, from Iceland. So for example, we have Torvajökull already mentioned, it's usually very high in potassium and a li little bit lower in silica than Aska, which is much lower in potassium and so on. Some of them are more difficult. Some are very active. Grimsvatten, for example, it has an eruption on average every 10th year. And the products, the ash particles, they seem to have the same composition for every uh, eruption. Yes, I mentioned, I think, already the very ash. And the very ash is probably the most important finding of ash layers in the North Atlantic region that's been made during the last 30 or 40 years. The very ash, it erupted uh, from the volcano Katla in the middle part of the Younger Dias. It's been found in the Greenland ice cores and is dated there by ice valves to uh, 12,100 years. So it's more or less in the middle part of the Younger Dias. I did some work in Western most Russia some 20 years ago. And since that, the Verde ash has been found in this gray area all the way down to the Mediterranean, to Slovenia actually by Lane and others in 2011. And quite recently, two years ago, it was published another paper showing that the Verde ash has been found all the way to the Ural Mountains in Russia and in Greenland and in many other places. And I think my final slide here shows how you can use these tephra layers or ash layers. This is from a paper uh, by Christine Lane a few years ago, 2012, I think, showing the Verde ash in three different uh, climate archives. The MFM is uh, actually a lake, Merfelde Mar, in Germany. It's a lake with varves, so it's possible to count the varves there. Krokenes is another lake in western Norway. The North Grip is, a, a ice, uh, is an ice core for Greenland. And there are some differences here. This is the Younger Dryas, the Vedash, 12,100 years more or less found in all three archives, but there is, in the lake record from Germany, there is a change in the climate. There is a transition somewhere 100 years before the Vede Ash to a more variable, more, yeah, more variable uh, climate here, which is shown by higher rates of titanium, for example, in the lake. So probably more uh, precipitation, more winter snow during the second part of the Younger Dryas. Here in Norway, there's a similar change also in this proxy showing uh, erosion and winter conditions, winter snow conditions, I think, in this case. But this uh, change occurs some 30 years after the Verde Ash. And in Greenland, there's no evidence for a mid younger Dryas cli climate uh, warming or amelioration of the climate. So this shows that this uh, change in climate, this uh, mid younger Dryas abrupt climate change during the younger Dryas is time transgressive. And it can be shown because it occurred before the Verde Ash in Germany, slightly after the Verde Ash in Norway, and there's no evidence for that in Greenland. So this has probably something to do with changes of the polar front, which is more moving towards the north during the Younger Dryas. 
Okay, that was the end of my talk actually, for the second part of this webinar. I hope you're still awake. We still have 17, 70 attendees. I will stop screen sharing. Arjen, are you still there? Yes. Of course. Good. <clears throat> so, are there any questions to us or are you exhausted or waiting for lunch? Nikki says, thank you. It was excellent. That's nice to hear. But we can be, we can wait here some minutes to see if we get any questions. There's a question from Shung Yang. Uh, have you developed some methods to automatically identify the geomorphological structures, eskers, lineations? I think that's a question to Aryan. Yeah. Um, have I? No, I haven't. But ha have people? Yeah, people are working on uh, um, artificial intelligence kind of uh, studies to um, to automatically delineate uh, landscape features. So yes, that, that is an ongoing research field that I am not particularly well connected to. Um, and some of our colleagues from this, this department, former graduates are, are, are working on it. But uh, no, I, I'm, but not myself, but yes, it is, a, it is certainly an ongoing field. <clears throat> It was a great trip, says Nikki. Yeah, good. How's the weather in Greek now? I saw, I heard they had a lot of snow some weeks ago. No. Yes, indeed. Uh, which satellite ima Im imagery would you recommend, Professor Arjen? Um. Well, it, it 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 quite depends a bit on what you uh, what you want to do, I guess. But uh, I would probably go for the lidar uh, imagery that has now it's widespread. It has a real good coverage. I'd probably go for that if you want to look at landforms. If you want, of course, have uh, imagery of you know if you want to look at vegetation or something like that as well, then you would have to go to. Uh, um, to uh, some satellite imagery, I would probably go to uh, some of the products from the Copernicus uh, uh, satellite families. I would go. Yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. And Valentina has a question. Maybe that's a follow-up for 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 the landforms. As a geomorphologist, that's. Suppose LIDAR again, but LIDAR is not available in all countries, I think. Yeah, I don't have a good feeling for that. I would suppose that all countries are developing LIDAR uh, imagery. Mm. Um, you have very, well, you have, yeah, I don't know. You have an Arctic database, for example, that is uh, basically complete. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of LIDAR around now. Romania, okay. I don't know about Romania. <coughs> More questions? Okay, and it's a message from Nikki about the next webinar tomorrow. Mm, good. And uh, as you have seen, I've recorded this uh, webinar and I will uh, try to convert that into an MP4 file, I think, and send the link to Nikki so that she can upload that on the, the CVS web page. Yeah. And I also got a lot of emails from students 
who wants a certificate of attendance, I will try to sort it out before the end of this week. So if you don't hear from me, please send uh, an email again to my address. I think you have got it in the chat. Okay, I, I don't see any more questions. No. Are you happy? It's lunchtime here in Sweden. It's over, over lunchtime. Could you please put here the page of the Journal of Quaternary Science? <clears throat> uh, which paper do you mean, Valentina? Is that the one that you showed the title of in your lecture, Stefan? Yeah, I think so. Where you said you work. I'm not quite sure what you mean here, Valentina. Maybe you can go back to your lecture and mm -hmm. look at it. <clears throat> at the beginning. Yes. Can you see the last one? Do you that mean one? One? do you mean this one? Yeah. Oops. So it's, it's Volume 34, is it? Yeah. Volume 34, uh, yes. So you can write it down if you want to. Yeah, excellent. Okay, shall we stop there? It's two o'clock. Britta says thanks as well. Okay then, yeah. thank you for attending. And happy that you enjoyed this, the webinar. And good luck with the rest of the webinars this week. Thank you to Arya. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming in. Yeah. Okay. Bye for now. I will Bye. end this webinar now.